welcome you for this new uh, gift. I know we hope that we will meet you today, maybe next year, but uh, today and all the week we will have a virtual gift. And I will want to thanks to Alberto, to Alberto Montani, Montanari, who is a EGU vice president, who is with us to open this, uh, this gift today. So I'm going to leave Alberto to, to tell you some words to begin this uh, new edition. Alberto, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Jean-Luc. And uh, I also would like to thank already now all the organizers of this gift workshop. It's a pleasure for me to substitute today the EGU president, Helen Glaives, uh, uh, who is not able uh, to join us today, to bring a foreword from the EGU governance. Actually, the GIFT program is uh, one activity that EGU is really motivated to promote further because we think that education is extremely important to create uh, the proper background for the future researchers on uh, fundamental issues uh, related to geosciences. EGU is uh, a scientific association. We mainly focus on research, but uh, we realized already several years ago, I would say since the inception of EGU, we realized that uh, in order to effectively support uh, scientific research in sciences, uh, we need also to contribute to education as I said, to uh, create a proper background for the students already in the period of the high school. This is why uh, our motivation to support the gift program is still increasing. We are really motivated to promote it further. And the motivation increased also because we became aware by looking at the gift workshops of their success. And the success uh, is uh, granted by the attendance, by the interest of the teachers, uh, like uh, teachers like you today. And for this reason, uh, I'm uh, really pleased to thank you, uh, teachers, for attending. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, all uh, the persons who are presenting who dedicate uh, a lot of efforts uh, to make uh, our scientific world accessible to teachers and students. This is really something that EGU is uh, motivated, as I said, to promote further. And uh, I really hope that uh, you can take uh, the best uh, of, uh, of the outcome, of the possible outcome from this workshop, even if it's held again in virtual mode. These workshops in the past, of course, took uh, place uh, in a physical presence. Uh, as you know, during the past two years, this was not possible. We are really looking forward uh, in the future to, uh, to a new mode, for delivering these workshops uh, that combines uh, the advantages of the virtual attendance, which of course has some benefits, uh, combines these advantages with uh, the advantages of the physical attendance, which gives uh, more opportunity for uh, an interaction besides uh, uh, what is the workshop time. So once again, uh, let me thank uh, very much the organizers uh, and uh, the presenters uh, and uh, the attendants. I also would like to address a special thought to Chris King, but I think that uh, probably Carlo will uh, uh, say something about that. I just uh, uh, would like to say that uh, I'm really thankful to Chris uh, for his uh, past support. Uh, and I really feel that Chris is with us today. Thank you very much once again. Thanks. Alberto, for this uh, opening uh, moment. Uh, for everyone, of course, this gift is a special one. It's a special one first because it is the 20th anniversary of the gift. And I am 
asking to Carlo to tell us more about this celebration of our 20th uh, anniversary of a gift. So uh, uh, please, uh, Carlo. Good morning. This year it is the 20th anniversary of the uh, Committee on Education and Gift Workshops. So some colleagues of mine asked me to give a few words about how this committee was created and of the major steps in the, which were achieved in this last 20 years. The committee was created in 2002 uh, with the aim of bringing state of art science into tomorrow classroom. And I was lucky when I proposed this to EGU to meet André Berger and Arne Richter, who supported the idea from the very beginning. We certainly were inspired by the teachers' workshop of the American Geophysical Union, but from the very beginning, we, to, oh, we wanted to have uh, our own personality. So, Contrary to what was done in the States, where the teachers came from the, from the place where the meeting was uh, obtained, we wanted teachers to come from as many as possible different nations, meaning that we had to fund them both for travel and living expense. Then we wanted the gift workshop to focus every year on a single general theme that changed each year. And of course, compared to the American, we had the, to ch the challenge of a multicultural, multi-language audience, which were met from the very beginning. And so that uh, we could include teachers from Europe and elsewhere in the world. So in 2003, the first gift workshop took place in Nice and uh, Jean-Luc Berenguer and myself were probably the two oldest members of the committee to be there. And then followed the six years of uh, growing success for many reasons. First of all, the General Assembly moved to Vienna which was much more favorable for gift because of Eastern proximity of Eastern European countries. And so that the number of applications increased to the point that we had to limit the number of participants to about 8085, both for financial reasons and also for uh, uh, space availability in the in the in the center international center in vienna this is, gives you an idea of the different topics which were aborted in the first five or six years you know history of the earth polar region and so on why we had such a success also because not only because it is new, but uh, we introduced hands-on activity to be performed by the teachers during during the the session, and also a poster session, which is called Science in Tomorrow's Classroom, where the teachers were invited and encouraged to present their activity in school, particularly out of the official program activity, which was open also to non-teachers participants. And one thing which attracted the teachers was that we selected really top scientists to address them, including two Nobel Prize winners, Paul Crutzen for the Anthropocene and uh, Ozone Studies in the Atmosphere, and more recently, Michel Mayor, who discovered the exoplanets. So planets turning around a sun, which is not our sun. In uh, 2009 and 2010, two 
major steps were done. First of all, we registered the gift uh, topical presentation on video, and then we moved to Merida, Yucatan, first time out of Europe, in the footsteps of uh, Alexander von Oberst. This is, means that the EGU was organizing there the Alexander von Oberst topical conference. And we uh, joined this in 2014, in collaboration with UNESCO, we moved first time to Africa at Port Elizabeth, Port Elizabeth in South Africa. And then a series of uh, international gift workshop to place Africa again in Ethiopia. Here is a view of the participants in the Botanical Garden at Addis Ababa. Then we moved to Penang in Malaya, in Istanbul, in Kutsko, again in 2016 in Merida and Cape Town, and in 2000 to the traditional gift workshop during the General Assembly in Vienna. And every time we adapted the theme of the gift workshop so that it was interesting, particularly for the, for the nation we moved to. For instance, ocean acidification was important for Malaya because of the coral reefs which were deteriorating. In uh, 2012, Cusco, the preservation of world heritage sites. In uh, Istanbul, we had high impact natural hazards and uh, earthquake, of course. In uh, Ethiopia, we address the general theme of water, which is a major problem in Ethiopia. And finally, in uh, Merida again, natural hazard. In this year, 2022, we started two capacity building gift workshop. These are the hugest program of gift workshop outside of Europe. And it, it should have started in 2020, but there were a stop of two years because of the COVID pandemics. And I would like to come back one second to the 2016 Cape Town gift workshop because it was associated with the International Ge Geological Con Congress to which Chris King also participated uh, because he was part of the uh, International Committee. And uh, I took the opportunity to ask him whether he would become, he would be interested in becoming a member of our committee. And I was very happy on 9th of January 2017 to receive this letter, which uh, I launched here. So this is my last slide. In 2017, Chris King participated to his first ever uh, Chris, uh, sorry, gift workshop, both as an indicator here, you see, in front of a different uh, experiments, he would demonstrate to the teachers and explaining the earth learning idea is fabulous site, especially done for education. And in the second picture here, you can see Chris listening to a South African educator. And these are the two aspects of Chris, which have impressed me quite a lot. He was a wonderful, educator, but he was also open to ideas and to methods of other educators. And unfortunately, Chris passed away on February 25, 2022. And so from here, I pass the word to my colleague, Jean-Luc Berenguer.
Thank you. Thanks so much, Carlo. So, uh, effectively, um, we cannot begin GIFT 2022 without thoughts and a tribute for Chris King. Uh, well, Chris King uh, joined the EGU Education Committee in 2017, and he became its chair the following year. Of course, Chris has started his career as a geoscientist working in Africa. He moved into education, become a specialist in earth science on the science teacher training team at Kiel University in the UK. It was from there that he led the way in developing a number of geoscience education initiatives that culminating on his appointment as professor of earth science education at Kiel University. It was in 2003. Chris, as Carlo said, was a so great promoter of geoscience education, not only in UK, but around the world. Uh, he has created so simple and so effective tools to help researcher, to help teacher to promote geoscience. It is with this spirit he was also led the education committee in recent years. His impact in promoting geoscience education was so evident. Naturally, everybody thinks on earth learning idea. How to describe earth learning idea? I will say that um, is a treasure, is a treasure for of resource for teachers, is a treasure because it's a huge amount of hands-on activity for schools. And it's also a treasure because it is a, a so great legacy for educators. We have learned a lot from Chris and many new action uh, have been created under his leadership. Chris brought with him a joyful enthusiasm and commitment that inspired a number of initiatives for the committee. As the first generation of EGU field officer, this uh, first generation of EGU field officer, you will meet them uh, Thursday during the gift. And it was, it is a, a wonderful project uh, to, to have so many educators uh, tra trained by Chris uh, around the Europe and, uh, and beyond. But Chris was not only recognized as an educator, his calm, his uh, pragmatic approach was always appreciated by those who knew him. And for me, he often brought a so fresh insight of a challenging uh, problems. Chris was a colleague, a mentor, and a friend. Chris has shared so many projects, advice, and kindness around him. He would uh, have loved to learn more from him. But we are also truly grateful for the time we could spend together. I would like to share with you one of his last messages that he sent us a few weeks ago, a few weeks before he passed away. So I will just let you read this message. Yes, Chris, you will be greatly missed and we will try to cherish your precious uh, legacy. Chris would have loved this gift, this new gift of gift 2022. He was indeed involved in its conception and realization. Topic and form do reflect exactly Chris' work and spirit. Well, 
Now it's time for the gift, for the gift 2022. And uh, I would like that uh, Costas, members of education committee, tell you more about uh, this uh, general uh, uh, introduction for the gift 2022. Costas? Yes, thank you, Jean-Luc. I'll be very quick because we are five minutes behind schedule and I'm telling you I'm worse than the Swiss. So I'll clean now, so I'll catch up. Uh, we had uh, uh, this year 84 teachers. Not everybody is logged in, as I see. Plus, we have one class of students from a junior high school in Halandri. Uh, we have persons from 18 countries. We have, um, and my mistake here, I say 10 excellent speakers. We have more than that, actually. Um, we have around 14. Um, uh, we have also two hands-on activities on Wednesday. The one will be from uh, will be presented by Jean-Luc, uh, who just spoke before me, and the other one by the EGU field officers. Uh, Tim, don't forget, please. Next slide, please. So, well, this workshop is about the influence of earth processes geological or climatic processes or whatsoever processes and the influence they have on how the human society and civilizations um, are established and progress or uh, become extinct throughout uh, history. And next slide, please. So we will start today. Um, with presenting some aspects of this very diverse theme. And then tomorrow we'll speak about climatic aspects, Wednesday for on cities, Thursday about environmental history, and Friday about ice and ash, that is glaciation and volcanoes. Uh, so we'll start with Ray Duzer today. Um, I saw he's logged in about the ecology of Pleistocene uh, Europe um, as it is represented in uh, Paleolithic cave paintings. And the last slide, please. Um, and um, I would like to remind you, um, um, all uh, attendees of GIFT, um, that you can register for free to the General Assembly, which is the first time that takes place not at the same time as gift. Um, it takes place in um, uh, May, and you can register and follow the sessions if you like to. Thank you and have enjoy the talks. Thank you, Costas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. So, as Costas said, uh, we will begin with Ray Dozer from University of Virginia. So we are going to make a back to the Paleolithic cave painting. Uh, Mr. Dozer must be with us. I have seen him. Are you there? Here. Yeah. I am, I am Welcome. here. Yes. Welcome, Ray. And uh, Good morning. I, I think you can share your screen uh, because uh, try to to share your screen, please. Okay, good. So this first presentation is uh, as the, the title is uh, completely. Uh, clear for for everyone. So um, I am going to leave the stage to Ray Duzer to to speak about uh, this uh, ecology of place to can. So please. Yes. Good morning or or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I've spoken to a group uh, this diverse and in this many places. So uh, uh, thank you for uh, inviting my participation. Um, uh, again, we'll begin this session with uh, a, 
a little bit of an overview of the ecology of Pleistocene Europe as represented in the Paleolithic cave paintings. Um, uh, just a bit of review to try to try to make my presentation fit in. My my presentation may be a little bit different. I'm not talking about civilization per se. Um, uh, the theme of this year's gift uh, workshop is how planet how the planet shapes history, geosciences, human society, and and uh, uh, and civilizations. Um, uh, I'm actually here to talk about a time before history, about the upper Paleolithic prehistory of Western Europe, uh, uh, specifically Southern France and Northern Spain. I'll do my best to respect the workshop theme as we explore the influence of geology and climate on the society, on the society of early modern humans on the European continent. Uh, note that I specify modern humans our earlier human relatives, the Neanderthals, occupied parts of Europe for at least 250,000 years before Homo sapiens arrived. Uh, we are learning more about Neanderthal society and ecology with each passing year, but this presentation will focus on our own species. Um, a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I've done some archaeology uh, in the southwestern United States, but I'm, I'm not a card-carrying archaeologist, paleontologist, art historian, or geologist. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about all these things today, but I am not one of these people. I'm an ecologist with an interest in how other people living in other places and other times express their perception of the world around them. And that includes the people who created the Paleolithic cave art of Western Europe. So I'm, I'm not an authority on anything I'm gonna talk about, but I am an interested observer of these things, an interested student of these things. Uh, what are we gonna to discuss today? We're gonna to start with the arrival of Homo sapiens, modern man in Europe. We'll talk about the environment of Western Europe at the time of their arrival the artistic capabilities of these early Europeans and the subjects they portrayed in their cave paintings. And finally, we'll look at a series of questions about what, what we can learn uh, about these people by examining their artwork. And I'm gonna give you a lot of dates today. Uh, some, I'll, some I'll say, uh, uh, that I, some I'll express, others are simply embedded in slides understand all of these dates are, uh, are approximate and they're subject to revision uh, uh, with the discovery of new sites and the dating of those sites. They're subject to revision based on uh, uh, simple revision of, of and new techniques, new technology to establish dates for known sites. Uh, modern humans arrived in Europe about 50,000 years ago. DNA studies of people living today indicate that modern humans migrated from Eastern Africa to the Middle East, then Southern and Southwest Asia, and then finally uh, uh, to uh, uh, then New Guinea and Australia, followed by Europe and Central Asia. So uh, modern humans arrived uh, in, uh, in, in Europe uh, relatively late uh, in the in their dispersal out of Africa, um, uh, uh, they, we think they arrived in in Western Europe in in Europe about fifty thousand years ago. Um, <clears throat> new discoveries may push this date back a bit, but fifty thousand is a good number. Uh, these people entered the very cold world of the late glacial maximum, a world of tundra, steppe, open forest, permafrost, and glaciers. They entered into a very cold world uh, with uh, a thousand feet or more of, of, uh, of, of glacial ice in Northern Europe, a broad band of, of tundra, uh, below that, and, and a broad band of steppe, 
further south from the tundra. Uh, you can see this permafrost line uh, extends all the way across Europe and, and Asia. Uh, most, most, but not all of the sites that uh, uh, were occupied by uh, uh, by the early Europeans were south of the permafrost line. Obviously, uh, uh, so they they moved into a very cold world, a challenging world, uh, and they uh, this obviously created. Uh, a need for them to move, migrate, uh, uh, and uh, uh, occupy different locations uh, on a millennial time scale. Uh, they encountered a cold but highly variable climate in Europe. It was colder at some times than in others. The light blue indicates periods of glacial advance. Uh, so you can see there was uh, between 35,000 and, and today, 35,000 years uh, before now. And today you can see that uh, there was a lot of variability uh, and periods of extended ice, uh, ice advance, uh, followed by uh, ice retreat, ice advance, ice retreat, and so forth, uh, up to today where we've, we think we're essentially out of the, we're, we're out of the late glacial maximum. It extended from you know, 35,000, 50,000 years ago uh, up to about 8,000 years ago, 7,500 years ago. Uh, and we recognize different cultural horizons through, the, through this long period of time. Um, uh, this diagram illustrates the relationship between climate change and uh, and, uh, and the major cultural periods of the Upper Paleolithic. This is the environment into which uh, Homo sapiens uh, walked after she left Africa in the Middle East. Uh, this is an interesting, interesting study uh, published in, in 2015, uh, looking at population range and, and density in Europe. We see that th this was a simulation study based on uh, an extensive uh, review and incorporation of the archaeological history, uh, the archaeological record. Uh, uh, these these two uh, uh, these uh, actually several authors uh, simulated produced a simulation of uh, human geographic range and population density during different phases of that late, late glacial maximum. Specifically, they worked from 30,000 years ago to 13,000 years ago. Uh, they found that the occupied home range of, of uh, the occupied range of, of humans uh, fluctuated considerably during this period of time. It's, expanding in some in some eras and contracting in others um, and uh, it depended on climatic conditions the range tended to expand during warm periods and contract during colder um, population density also fluctuated through time from a maximum of about 330,000 soon after the entry of humans into Europe, down to perhaps 130,000 during a particularly cold uh, era uh, 23,000 years ago. Uh, population rebounded up to maybe 410,000, 13,000 years ago. Again, this is a simulation that's based on an extensive review and incorporation of the archeological record. Um, so uh, you can see that over much of this, uh, this period, this long 30,000 year period of time, uh, there were vast areas where population density was either zero, uh, zero in the range of zero to one person per hundred square kilometers. That's a low population density. With one person per, per hundred square kilometers, modern Europe uh, uh, 
with an area of about 10 million uh, square kilometers would have a population of 102,000 people. Well, I've been to events in Paris where there were more than 100 and 102,000 people present at a, at a given point in time. Uh, for another point of reference, New York City has an area of 472 square miles of uh, 1,200 square kilometers. At one person per 100 square kilometers, that works out to 12 people in the city, in New York City. Many of you probably have seen New York City uh, versus the 2020 population of over 8 million. So this was a period when human population range and, and population density varied dramatically. These people did not live in crowded conditions. Well, these early, early humans encountered a fauna in Europe of, of absolutely breathtaking diversity. I refer to this as a veritable Arctic Serengeti. Uh, much of the uh, upper Paleolithic art we'll discuss today focused on animals, the Pleistocene megafauna. Uh, there are literally thousands of examples of engraved, drawn, painted, and sculpted upper Paleolithic uh, uh, examples of upper Paleolithic art. And almost all of it represents the animals that populated the mammoth steppe landscape. <clears throat> Early man obviously drew profound influence from the animals uh, around which he lived. This image depicts a late Pleistocene, uh, what's referred to as a mammoth steppe landscape uh, in, in Northern Spain with, you can see mammoths, woolly rhinoceros, uh, an equid of some kind in the, in the back. And, and two cave lions feeding on a, on a, on a reindeer. Uh, uh, so the, this is the, essentially the landscape into which these early humans broke into Europe. The Pleistocene megafauna of Europe was a, a breathtaking diversity of herbivores, predators, and a variety of other smaller, uh, smaller, uh, smaller animals. Um, the, this is the, these are the animals that these, that these uh, early Europeans uh, encountered, lived with, relied upon, feared, and had to deal with uh, in their daily lives. Now, these early Europeans obviously uh, uh, entered into this new world, bringing with them a complex brain, advanced cognitive ability, complex spoken language, control of fire, efficient new lithic technologies, new, new weapons they brought with them, needle sewn clothing, the ability to organize complex social activities and an understanding of the benefits of the division of labor. We know these things because of, of, of what these people left behind. There's no written record, of course, but the, 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 uh, the archeological record they left behind is utterly consistent with, uh, with, with this list of what these early Europeans brought with them. Uh, they also brought with them the ability to create what we now call art they knew how to draw, how to paint, how to engrave, sculpt, and carve. They were very adept at all of these artistic techniques. And of course, what followed was a truly remarkable flowering of both uh, mobile art, uh, for example, eff effigies designed to be carried from place to place, and parietal art, art placed on a rock surface or cave wall. And it's the parietal art that we're focused on today. Uh, these early modern Europeans occupied a mountainous landscape, occupied, uh, occupied a mountainous landscape uh, of karst geology. There was abundant water, rock shelters, and deep caves. Uh, I think of it as being much like the, the Shenandoah Valley here in, in Western Virginia. 
Uh, this slide shows both the cavernous entry into uh, uh, Les Combarelles cave in uh, Dordogne, France, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, southwestern France, and the valley setting in which the cavern sits. This location provided shelter, water, plant resources, and abundant game near a shared water resource. If, if you were living in southern France 50,000 years ago, 40,000, 30,000 years ago, this would be considered, uh, this would be considered fine living. For the most part, the, uh, these early humans lived in rock shelters and they painted in caves. We find some art, some parietal art in rock shelters today. Uh, these are shallow, depre relatively shallow depressions, overhangs, if you will, and cliff faces uh, and mountainsides. Uh, they provided shelter from the weather. Uh, they and they and they always provided light. Uh, if the sun was shining, these these rock shelters were lit. If the sun were shining, it was likely these these shelters were warmed. They were protected from rainfall, snow, precipitation of all kinds. They provided a good place to live. It required less, it, it required us only a small amount of, of fuel to, to be able to occupy and warm and, and modulate the temperature of these rock shelters. Uh, caves, well, tended to be uh, deep, deep recesses in rock sur surfaces. Um, a cave could be, uh, uh, they were poorly lit, uh, often uh, cold, uh, sometimes wet. Uh, they could provide a place to live, but it would require a lot of fuel to provide fire and heat. Uh, and as, and they could be dangerous places. The cave, the cave might, might cave in. Uh, surface, the rock, uh, the, the ceiling might cave in. They were dangerous places. So these early Europeans lived in rock shelters and painted in caves. Uh, they devised a host of now familiar drawing and painting techniques. This was not doodling. They knew how to outline, contour line, cross contour, parallel hatching, cameo and intaglio marking, modeling, foreshortening, uh, carving in relief, carving. Uh, they knew all of these things. They had, they had a, a full toolkit of artistic techniques and tools. They either brought those things with them or they, uh, or they learned them soon after arrival. They acquired them soon after arrival. So what subjects did these Ice Age artists uh, choose to represent in their art? Plants? No, not very much. No, you, we don't find plants. Clouds? No, we don't find clouds. One another? No, they didn't, they didn't paint one another. At least we have, no, we have very little record of, of uh, human figures in Paleolithic art. Landscapes? No, they didn't provide scenes. Um, uh, no, they chose to paint pictures of the animals that shared their Ice Age landscapes. Humans very seldom show up in cave paintings, and then usually as some sort of fertility symbol, often female genitalia, less frequently male genitalia. Fish and birds show up rarely, mosaic figures in only a few locations. They painted, engraved, and carved representations of the magnificent mammals which surrounded um, uh, which surrounded them so abundantly. Uh, hand stencils, finger doodles, and tectiform or, or geometric shapes accompany figurative forms in many of these caves. Um, and there's uh, uh, increasingly, it seems, uh, some of these tectiform shapes may have been uh, produced by Neanderthals. Uh, there was a recent study uh, that analyzed the co-occurrence of 3,300 different figurative forms in 84 caves and rock shelters in Western Europe. 
So this is the, the motifs that showed up in these, um, in these polythematic panels in these 84 caves and rock shelters. Uh, what you see is that uh, cave art was dominated by horses and bison. Uh, there were far more horse and bison representations than anything else. Uh, and following horses and bison, you, you find a, a long list of, of, uh, of, other, of other mammals. Uh, I'm sorry, of other herbivores. Uh, and then you get down as to anthropomorphs, uh, maybe human figures of some sort, and then reindeer come after anthropomorphs, and then you get down to the to the uh, uh, to mostly the the carnivores, the predators with which these people live. Uh, and uh, so, uh, what is often said of these people is that they painted horses and they ate reindeer. There's little correspondence between the food remains, the, the, the bones found in cave, in, in cave environments uh, and, uh, and the paintings that occur in those environments. There's little correspondence there. Again, they painted horses, but they ate reindeer. Uh, there are approximately 260 known painted cave sites in Europe, concentrated primarily in France and Spain. There are no, uh, there's no telling how many more caves uh, are, have yet to be discovered. Many of the, of the Paleolithic caves have been subject to roof collapse or rock slides, sealing, sealing, off, the, the, uh, uh, sealing off the entries. This has, of course, made caves inaccessible and, uh, and served to protect the art contained therein. Occasionally, a new cave is discovered, usually by accident. The most recent discovery was Chauvet Cave in France, uh, located, it's not on here, but it's located right, right here, right about where I've got my pointer, right here in southern France. Uh, it was discovered by three spelunkers only in 1994, uh, and Chauvet is now it's the most recent, this most recently discovered painted cave, and it's now considered to be the Sistine Chapel of cave art. The work is so fine and and so extensive. The world's attention. Uh, uh, cave art has been the subject of study since the early 1800s, but the world's attention was drawn to it with the discovery of Lascaux Cave in, in, in 1940. Uh, in that year, uh, four young men who's, who are circled, uh, whose faces are circled in this photograph uh, from 1940, uh, they literally found this, this cave by by. Uh, following their dog, robot, uh, through a, what they thought was a, into what they thought was a fox den, it turned out to open into a large cavern. And when they when they uh, ventured inside deeper inside, they discovered that it was it was the walls and ceilings were covered with with uh, figurative representations of of, of Pleistocene mammals. Uh, so uh, this uh, was discovered in 1940 and uh, was considered to be the, the, the most, the grandest uh, representation of uh, presentation of, of Pleistocene cave art. Uh, and it held that reputation uh, until the discovery of, of uh, Chauvet Cave almost a, well, a half century later. Um, by 1948, Lascaux was open to the public and it was then closed to the public in 1963 because of the degradation that was being uh, observed uh, from the entry of people and the import of bacteria and microbes and dust and other things. So you can see Lasco today 
in what's called last go for of representation of, uh, uh, of the uh, of the cave, uh, a reproduction. Okay, this slide provides a link to uh, a spectacular virtual tour of Lasco. We don't have time for this tour today, but I highly encourage you to take it yourself when you have 15 minutes. The tour, this tour is guaranteed to inspire your interest in caves and the people who painted them. So I, I strongly encourage you to, to, to take a look at this. Just click on this Vimeo link down here. I believe it'll still get you to that, uh, to that tour. Oh, geez, I, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Okay. Let's delve into some specific questions about the about the cave art and artist. Were both sexes involved in cave paintings? Was this a man's world, or were women and children allowed in? How skilled were the artists? Did the painters actually uh, accurately portray what they saw? Did these artists tell stories and portray events from life? Did they record history? Uh, why did they paint on the cave walls? Uh, this is an interesting study, and to make uh, to, to to make it a little shorter, to make the story a little shorter, uh, there is a basis for recognizing the gender of of hand prints, the, these type of of hand uh, uh, of, of hand paintings, that hand stencils that were left on a lot of cave walls. Uh, based on the geometry of those of those of those prints and the relationship of one finger to another, uh, uh, Snow in 2013 developed an algorithm for an analyzing hand architecture, and he analyzed a, a bunch of these hand stencils from eight European caves. 75% were classified as adult female hands. Clearly, females were involved in the creation of cave art. And the, the testing of this method suggests that, uh, that this number is probably pretty good. The algorithm is actually uh, capable of, of, uh, of, de of determining uh, uh, the gender of, a, of one of these hand stencils. So 75% uh, were classified as adult female. So women were in, were in the caves. They participated in some, at some level in cave, producing cave art. In other caves, we actually have footprints uh, of children. Uh, so we know that children were uh, at least admitted to the caves and perhaps involved in, in painting. Uh, how skilled were the cave painters as, as artists? That is, could they portray feeling, motion, and perspective? I'm going to let you judge this for yourself from viewing a few selected images. Admittedly, I selected these for a purpose. Uh, what do you see here? When you look at this, when you look at this, knowing that it's Ice Age art, knowing something about the landscape on, in, in, on which this art was produced, what do you see? Uh, this is uh, from Peshmerl Cave. It dates about 25,000 uh, BCE, although this is just the outline of a head and trunk and upper back of a mammoth. It has, it has been uh, superbly done, and it evokes the animal with a minimum of brush strokes. This is, to my eye, this is a woolly mammoth. I don't, to me, there's no question what this is. Uh, the smudging of the head and 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 uh, and back, uh, whether deliberate or accidental, uh, does not detract from the worth of the image. Adds to the power that it is a woolly mammoth. This is a spectacular engraving uh, in the cave of Les Combarelles in southern, again in southern France. Uh, it's particularly it's a particularly well known engraved image of a reindeer, spectacularly detailed, with a massive rack of of antlers, uh, uh, clearly a a penis engraved as a as a on a male, and it uh, the head is bowed, drink appearing to drink. This is called the drinking uh, uh, reindeer, 
appearing to drink from a crack in the in the uh, uh, in, in the cave wall. Uh, clearly, this engraving was done with great detail, and it was clearly placed in a location where this image, this is, a, it appears to be a drinking reindeer, drinking from a source of water uh, portrayed by a by a crack in the cave wall. This is the famous red bull from Altamira Cave in Spain, 15,000 years old. It depicts a bull bison in prime condition in the Great Hall of Polychromes in Altamira. Uh, note the use of both red and black paints to represent the animal in a, in a bold manner. And the placement of the image on a bulging portion uh, of the cave wall uh, to give the animal depth and, and, and bulk. Is this an animal to fear or admire? We don't know whether they feared it or admired it. I suspect they did both. But clearly this artist chose that place on the cave wall to, to portray this, this bison and portrayed it in a dramatic manner and placed it to maximize the, the, uh, the drama and the impact of this piece of art. This is the uh, famous charging bull from Chauvet Cave, France. It's probably 32,000 years old. That's the best, that's a good date. Um, it's rendered in black on a white surface, a white background, and once again uses the uh, stone surface and smudging to portray depth and bulk. This is meant to portray a massive, strong, animal. Uh, more importantly, though, you can see there are multiple, there are at least two sets of legs portrayed here. Uh, this creates uh, an eight-legged beast intended to depict trotting or running. Uh, when I look at this image, uh, I see that the two overlaid uh, images, uh, two, uh, two bison's eight legs, uh, but clearly, I see a running bison here. I don't know if you see that, but that's what I see. This is an animal on the move. And this is the crossed bison panel from Lascaux, dated about 17,000 years. Uh, the artist took advantage of the cave surface texture and relief to create perspective and the illusion of movement, overlapping uh, the overlapping or repeating limbs uh, coupled with the flickering light of, of moving torches help the animate the work. And again, it's placed in a, on, in a, on a portion of the cave wall where uh, you are seeing two, two bull bison uh, literally running, uh, running, uh, running at you from within the cave wall. Again, these are animals on the move. It creates the illusion of galloping at top speed toward the viewer. The swimming, the swimming stags. Uh, here we have uh, five uh, stag heads, probably what we would call red deer today. And they appear to be swimming, perhaps in a river portrayed by this crack or crevice in the, in the cave wall. Uh, is this five stags swimming at the same time, or is this one stag shown in motion? What, whichever it is, it's exquisitely uh, 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 executed on on this on this wall. And finally, this is the great black bull oryx from uh, Lascaux. Uh, th this is a, a nice painting. It's it's an impressive rendering of a, a black aurox of a of a bull aurox. But the important thing about it is that it's rendered on the ceiling of the cave, four meters above the floor, and it's executed. It's five meters long. This is a giant representation. This is much larger than life size. Bull aurochs were large. This is even larger. The body proportions aren't perfect, but they're not bad. 
this work truly took a village to accomplish. Someone had to provide the light. Someone had to had to uh, collect the poles or the, the timber to produce a scaffolding. Someone had to create leather straps uh, to 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 tie the scaffolding together. Someone had to build the scaffolding. There were holes bored into the cave floor uh, to to provide placement for the scaffolding. This took a this took a community effort. This took a village to do. There was some social organization. There was some division of labor. Uh, this was a, 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 a massive undertaking to create this thing. This is not just another image of a bull. This is an, this is an image placed in a way that it took, uh, it took social organization to accomplish. This is, uh, to my mind, this is the most thrilling image in, in Lasco. Uh, did the cave painters accurately portray what they uh, what they observed around them? Um, did they represent locomotion realistically? That's one 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 test. Could they represent locomotion or walking realistically? Um, this is uh, one of the I'd say cutest images in 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 all of cave art. Oh, everything I know about. This is the frieze of small horses. Uh, this is a frieze of, of five diminutive horses. This entire painting is only a meter tall. All of these animals appear to be in motion. Their legs, uh, they're, not all their hooves are on the ground. They all, they're all going somewhere. Every, every one of them has at least one hoof off the ground. And again, it's a very diminutive portrayal the freeze of small horses. Well, uh, this is one of those things where uh, sometimes you publish a paper that lasts forever. Edward Mybridge, uh, 1886, published a photographic study of quadruped walking. Uh, he discovered the left hind, left fore, right, right hind, right fore footfall formula for quadrupeds. Uh, based on his analysis of literally thousands of, of photographs of, of a quadruped uh, locomotion. Uh, more recently, Harvath et al. In, in 2012 analyzed the footfall patterns of horses in three different groups of art, modern pre-Mybridge, modern post-Mybridge, and prehistoric. They examined a thousand quadruped walking depictions to determine the correctness of horse gait portrayal. They looked at horses, were horses shown with the right footfall pattern? Uh, Wait, 10 minutes for, more. 10 minutes more, you. Ray. Yeah. Thank you. Pre uh, Mybridge, 17% uh, correct. Uh, our, another, even Da Vinci sometimes got it wrong, portrayed the footfall pattern incorrectly. Post Mybridgean, about 42%. Uh, so uh, artists clearly learned from what Mybridge had observed. Uh, some of them learned from my modern taxidermist, about 49%. Paleolithic painters, 54% correct. These people were, were indeed close observers. They were, they were close observers of what they saw around them. And they were able, importantly, they were able to, to translate those close observations into accurate portrayals of, of, of the animals they, they painted. Uh, they, they were able to translate this into art. Did cave artists tell stories or portray events from life? Did they record history? That is, did they express narrative or simply paint images? This is where, uh, this is where interpretation becomes a little more challenging. There are no clear, unquestionable hunting scenes or family gatherings or celebrations or vistas represented in Paleolithic cave art. There are no scenes of travelers gathered around a, a, a water hole. This is not to say they weren't portraying a scene they had actually witnessed or an experience they had shared, but simply that they were, they were portraying it in a somewhat abstracted representation. There are, no, there are no family portraits. There are no family gatherings in Paleolithic cave art. 
this is the mystifying <clears throat> shaft scene located <clears throat> located in uh, the uh, shaft of the dead man in Lasco. This is one of the most uh, mystifying, uh, evocative scenes in all of Paleolithic cave art. The most literal interpretation is that the bison disemboweled by the spear uh, uh, has somehow has gored the, the hunter. However, a no, number of images and symbols that remain unexplained strongly suggest other layers of meaning. The bird-like head of the of the of the human. This is an anthropomorphic figure with a with a bird's head. The long erect uh, penis of the of the figure. Uh, the stick with the bird's head on it, the barbed stick lying here, uh, the bird-headed stick, uh, and, and there's, this is a departing rhinoceros uh, with uh, 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 six uh, 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 dots behind the anus. Uh, the remote and inaccessible, this is, this is at the bottom of a ten foot deep uh, of a ten foot deep shaft in the one of the deepest recesses of Lascaux Cave. The remote and inaccessible location of the painting also seems significant. What does it mean? A myth? A historical incident? A, uh, a historical incident? A warning to be careful when bison hunting. What does it mean? Well, we just we don't we don't know, but it's it's uh, it's as close to to narrative uh, as we find in in cave art. Uh, this is the frieze of lions in Chauvet. This is old. This is ancient, ancient, ancient art. Uh, it's been in, interpreted as portraying a hunt scene. This may be narrative, a pack or a, a, a pride of lions hunting, perhaps hunting this, this figure in the front here. We don't know quite what that figure is. It could be a rhinoceros, it kind of looks like a rhinoceros perhaps. Um, but when viewed in, uh, in, uh, in, in flickering torchlight, the image does in fact appear to move thanks to the optical phenomenon known as the persistence of vision. Uh, I hope to test this idea myself when I visit the Chauvet reproduction next month uh, in, uh, in France. Uh, again, there's the suggestion, if you see it in flickering light, yes, it, it, it almost looks like animation. The why of cave art, why did these ancient people create these images? All of art conveys a message of some sort. Uh, these, these folks left no written record. This was a time before history. They left us with this art. All art conveys a message. It serves as a signature, a warning, a prohibition, or perhaps a welcome. It conveys a story, a myth, a vision, or perhaps a metaphor, either sacred or profane. It affirms individual or collective presence at a location at a point in time. Communicates with one or more divine beings to establish a bond with the spirit world. So art, all art conveys a message of some sort. There are a variety of types of messages that it can convey. Again, we, we have we have no written record. In fact, any or all of these interpretations may be correct at certain times in certain places, but none makes uh, uh, sense as a universal explanation. Let's just look at art for art's sake. Maybe it's simply individual expression. Maybe it's totemism or animal worship, an expression of kinship between the artist and the animal he, he or she is representing. Maybe a sympathetic mag magic. Uh, they're trying to make the world as they want it to be. They're portraying the world that they want. Hunting magic, a plea for hunting success, 
uh, maybe representing the animal is is a plea for uh, is a form of of uh, praise for that animal and a plea for hunting success. Maybe fertility magic, a plea for abundant prey. Destructive magic, a plea for fewer predators. They didn't paint a lot of predators, so we're not sure about this, but there had to be a reason for painting them. Maybe it's shamanism, communication with the spirit world, uh, perhaps uh, communication uh, fueled by uh, hallucinogenic uh, plant materials, or simply by the by the stale air in the in the depths of the cave. Uh, it could even be uh, uh, hypoxia from uh, from the uh, from a lack of of oxygen with several people in a small cramped space uh, and uh, 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 the burning of animal fat in stone lamps to provide light and maybe heat. Uh, yeah, maybe the, maybe they just simply lost it because their oxygen level, blood oxygen went low. In fact, any or all of these interpretations may be correct in certain times in certain places. Uh, but none makes sense as a universal explanation. We weren't there. They left no clear record for us beyond their art. We can't, uh, uh, for, we, we can't know uh, for certain what they were trying to accomplish through their art or why they did it. But generations of scholars and other interested observers have drawn inspiration from viewing this art and attempting to understand and appreciate these people who lived in a time before history. I'd like to say thank you for your interest and patience and thank you to the EGU Gift Education Committee for providing me this opportunity to share my interest in a time before history. Uh, this year's theme of the gift workshop again is how the planet shapes history, geosciences, human society, and civilization. We began here before history. We've explored aspects of the influence of geology and climate on the society of, of early modern humans on the European continent. We've described some of the environmental challenges these people faced and some of the opportunities they experienced. Mostly we've explored some of the dimensions of artistic expression that arose when modern humans entered into a vast new world. One last little, some breaking news here. This is now 2018. A cow-like figure uh, has been discovered in Lubang Jinji Solid Cave in Borneo in South Asia. And it's reliably dated at 40,000 years BCE. This is this painting of a cattle-like cattle -like animal has been dated uh, at least 40,000, making it the oldest known figure to rock art in the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ray, for your interesting presentation. You can uh, close the, the sh sharing your, your screen. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, uh, thank you for your interesting uh, presentation. Well, I'm living in France, so I know uh, a lot of places uh, you mentioned in your presentation. Uh, if you have, if the participant have question, you can share the question on the chat. Why not? Or uh, so I, I appreciate that for many of many of you, this whole presentation is a case of bringing coals to Newcastle. Uh, mm -hmm. You probably know them know the material as well or even better than I. Uh, but I, I appreciate your patience in letting me uh, present a North American view of it all. Thank you. <laughs> I have I have a question. Ray, about uh, you, we have seen a map, and I see that the distribution of cave painting is not very uniform in Western Europe. Uh, there is a few cave painting or places in Italy. Is it right? Uh, if I, I compare with Spain and France, or are there, there are there are explanation uh, of this uh, distribution? 
there are a few caves known uh, outside of France and Spain. Uh, France and Spain are the world center, but there are a few cases. There are a few known caves known out, painted caves known outside of this area. Um, uh, most of those are much later than uh, they're at the very end, very end of the, of the Paleolithic uh, era. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't devote much as much. I didn't devote much time to those caves. Uh, but they're later. They're much later. I was more interested in the the cave art produced early in the occupation, early in the, the modern human occupation of of Western Europe. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, more caves are being discovered all the time. Magnificent caves are discovered are, are discovered periodically. Chauvet Cave, discovered in 1994 by three spelunkers who uh, followed uh, uh, a flow of, of cold air from a from a hole in the surface uh, and discovered Chauvet. Um, uh, and it turned out to be the most magnificent painted cave and the oldest ever discovered. You know, generations of, of French uh, archaeologists uh, Many, many of them more or less made their reputations by exp explaining the, the evolution of cave art from relatively primitive stick art type, uh, type representations uh, up, to, uh, up to Lascaux 17,000 years ago, the, the greatness of, our, of Lascaux. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it turns out that, that you know, that's just probably not, not how cave art evolved. It, Chavot is the oldest we have in Europe, and it is also, in many respects, the finest. Okay. I have a que one more question, but a quick answer, if possible, is what about the chemistry of this, uh, the colors used in the painting? Uh, yeah, the, the red, they, they, they used red and yellow, the red and black, sometimes I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't say this earlier. They used red and black, sometimes yellow. The red was derived from uh, iron oxide, hematite. Uh, the black was typically uh, manganese oxide or sometimes just charcoal. charcoal. So they, they, they relied on, on minerals to, uh, to, produce, uh, uh, to produce the paints that they used. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our gift continue, but uh, so we have a, a short break now until three thirty. So, well, seven, five, seven minutes to to have a coffee, to have a Elenico for our Greek uh, colleague, for, to have an espresso for our Italian colleague, and uh, be back uh, in a few minutes. It three thirty to welcome uh, uh, Grant uh, Heiken and speaking about the geology and Roman uh, So um, I hope everyone is coming back <laughs> after the, the coffee yeah. break or tea break, I don't know. Uh, it is our second presentation, uh, Grant, Hey, Ken. Hi, Ken. is going to talk about uh, very. Yeah, sorry, Grant. Hi, Ken. <laughs> Hi, Ken. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Ken. And um, okay, it's time to to have a, a view about this uh, geology and Roman civilization. Uh, and so, Grant, you have the stage to to present your. Uh, your slides now. Okay. Do you, thank you to be with us this afternoon once more time. Do you want uh, to be able to see me or not? Uh, I think it's better for the record, but. Uh, okay. Okay. And I'll go ahead. And the connection seems quite good. So, yeah. It's okay. Um, you're probably wondering why 
a volcanologist from the United States is dealing with Rome. Uh, to quickly state why, back in the mid to late 1990s, I was working with a group at Los Alamos on integrated urban science. And my main interest was to look at how cities have used geoscientists in their management and planning. And uh, I took a look around the world to see which of the major cities involved geoscientists in how they were, they were managed. And I came up with two, uh, Hong Kong and Rome. And uh, I have a very good friend, Renato Funicello, who was essentially responsible for much of the use of the geos geosciences within the city of Rome, the management. And uh, he produced a magnificent monograph called La Ge Geologia di Roma about that time. And I was talking to him about it. And I thought, well, I want to see how they did it. So I asked if I could come on my sabbatical leave to spend six months in Rome, which I did. And it was a, a great experience. Oh, having trouble getting going here. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, we'll start this with a scene that most of you have, an area most of you have visited, the Trevi Fountain. Uh, why, how does this relate to the geology of Rome? I'll just give a brief introduction here using the Trevi Fountain. Um, in Rome, the aqueducts brought water in from mostly the Apennines into Rome, into tunnels. The, uh, most of the, the plazas, the piazzas had, uh, I'm getting my cat off the desk here. Ah, okay. The, uh, the one at the Trevi was derided as kind of the village well. It was not a very attractive site. And basically the popes wanted this to be a visually beautiful place. If you look at the, uh, the aerial photograph of the Trevi Fountain, you see essentially there's three streets coming together here, which is possibly the origin of the name Trevi. Uh, looking at the fountain or standing on the street below you lies, and we'll get into this later, uh, about six meters of rubble from previous uh, occupations of Rome. And below that, uh, about so there's a 60 meter deep channel from the ancient Tiber. And that was carved when sea level was much lower and uh, then filled up with sediment as sea level rose. The water coming in to the Trevi Fountain uh, from the Virginia Aqueduct, the, the beautiful fountain itself is mostly travertine. The travertine is local. It comes from the Bagne di Tivoli outside of Rome. The figures are of Carrara marble, which is not from Rome, but from up along the Tyrrhenian coast where the famous Carrara marbles came from. The people are standing on uh, basalt, tiny basalt blocks, which are, you know, cover many, most of Rome's streets. They're called San Pietrini, and we'll get into that later. Uh, it's, uh, our little introduction. Okay, let's talk about the seven hills of Rome. The irony of the seven hills, this is a view from the Janiculum on the west side of the Tiber, looking across Rome toward the Apennines. And the first of the hills, the Quirinale, uh, sits up there. And essentially these are parts of a plateau, which we'll discuss later on how that plateau originated and that the, the, the quote unquote hills were separated by stream channels uh, carving 
small valleys, which eventually were partly filled up by man-made anthropogenic debris. The uh, going farther, here's several of the other of the seven hills down below along the trees there, you can see the Tiber itself. Uh, the most famous is the Capitoline, which was at one time the center of, of Roman uh, history and uh, it was sacred. And it's, it's just above the forum if you visited there. Okay, down swinging around toward the Aventine. Uh, that is probably the most delightful of the hills because it's quiet, which is unusual in Rome. In the distance are the Alban Hills, the Coli Albani. It's a large volcanic field, which we'll get into shortly. Uh, the, what we see here, okay, and on the side on the geniculum where we're standing, those are mostly tertiary sediments and uh, uplifted along faults parallel to the Tiber and actually controlling the path of the Tiber. Here's a, a synthetic aperture radar view of what we're looking at. The hills there, they're not very spectacular hills. The seven hills are mesas and that have been eroded and carved. And above the Tiber, which is to the left, the, the uh, plain of the Tiber, you can see going down through there. And on the west side, you see the, uh, the geniculum uh, the, and going up to the Vatican, which is just to the north there. And a long line along which there's a major road, which is a, uh, a fault. Looking at it more traditionally, aerial photo, there's a little box over the Trevi Fountain, not very big. Uh, but on here you can see, let's see, I can't, okay, here we go. See the, uh, the Colosseum, the Colosseo, uh, the Vittorio Emanuele Monument above the Piazza Venezia, uh, Tiber, Tiberian Island, and the Circus Maximus, the Cerco Massimo, uh, and the seven hills visible. Here's the Aventine down through here, uh, Trastevere through here in this area, and the Castel San Angelo to the north here. The, uh, there, if you go to the EUR, there's a museum out there where they have a magnificent model of ancient Rome, which gets updated every time they find a new structure of some sort. And uh, that's another way to be you know, platform of it. Uh, we're trying to get this thing going here. There we go. Uh, tectonics in Roman history. For those of you in tectonics, and I can talk to the two Francescas about this. There's the Apennines. Uh, through here, Rome is down here. Lago di Bracciano is over here. And in this cross section, you see essentially that the Apennines are formed by a whole series of major thrust faults. And uh, okay, give you where we are. There's Florence, Firenze up there, and Bolsena, and so on. Uh, essentially, north south to north, northwest, southeast, trending valleys along which there were Roman roads, but also essentially uh, encasing much of the other, many of the other cultures that surrounded Rome, like the Etruscans and the Campanians. And uh, give you a scale here. There's Rome again, Ostia, Ostia Antica, which is a great place to visit. Uh, and on down to Pozzoli. We'll talk about Pozzoli a little later for when we were talking about Pozzolana concrete. But uh, Rome had to conquer all these people before they could expand their empire, and they did. Timeline here, uh, part of it's covered, sorry. Uh, going back about uh, 100,000, I go from, uh, 
from 100,000 years to 10,000 years, 10,000 years to on down to the present, and then uh, one down here calling, showing all of the not only geological events, but the uh, historical events that occurred. And major things that formed the, the, uh, the plateau around Rome was actually the, the Alban Hills, which are very active throughout this whole period down to, well, recently from 100,000 years, but the Sabatini field uh, went from 300,000 years down to about 80,000 years. And at this point, one thing that helped control the shaping of the plateaus is sea level was 120 meters below the present. Uh, and sea level began to rise, continuing to the present. Uh, and first occupation of Rome was about 10,000 years ago. Uh, beginning of the Holocene and throughout this whole time, the Tiber Delta keeps growing outward into the sea. It has slowed since the mid 1950s when they started building dams on the Tiber, but the, the Tiber Delta growth was quite rapid and uh, they kept, they had to keep moving their, their major ports like Ostia, Ostia, which is now Ostia Antica, which was now along, you know, like four kilometers from the sea. Uh, and throughout this whole time, travertine, a major construction stone was being deposited and still continues to be deposited. Uh, down here, I'll point out, these are mostly geological events up here. The little shields are major floods on the Tiber. The, uh, these symbols down here are major earthquakes. One advantage to studying Rome geologically is the fact that the Romans kept great records. So any kind of natural event was uh, recorded and kept. And down here, you know, first settlements, Etruscan is expelled, Roman Republic, Imperial Rome, Pantheon constructed here, the first St. Peter's here. And which is important is that Rome was sacked by invaders from the north and had quite a bad time there for a long time. Baroque Rome, which is great for the use of various marbles that came through. Uh, but the interaction between the, the geology or natural events, particularly natural hazards and uh, Rome's development uh, are very uh, critical. Uh, as a volcanologist, one of my favorite topics here is studying the origins of the, the Roman plateau. The uh, plateau, let's see if I can get my, well, no, don't want that. Okay, that, 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 okay. Uh, but essentially going from the Alban Hills, you can see the caldera, major caldera up there. And it's the formation of that major caldera that deposited many or most of the pyroclastic flow deposits, which form the plateau going into Rome. Pyroclastic flow deposits are from major eruptions in which the, the, depo the ash deposits are deposited as uh, density currents and leave very distinctive deposits. The, uh, they're called ignimbrites. Uh, the ignimbrites are kind of unique in this region because of the, the aquifers below the, 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 the volcanic fields that are essentially karstic aquifers from the Apennines. You get a lot of interaction between magma and water, and that produces not only very energetic eruptions, but very fine-grained ash, which is easily altered and is important in construction stone coming in later. I mentioned the Tiber River Delta earlier. It uh, was expanding through history until uh, the, the middle of the 20th century. Um, you see the Apennines over there, that's important for water sources. And to the north is another large volcanic field, the Sabatini Volcanic Fields. And uh, that has produced deposits coming in around the uplifted uh, Pleistocene and, and tertiary rocks on the west side of Rome. A little closer view here. 
I mentioned, I was talking about hydrovolcanic eruptions, the interaction between magma and water. Um, most of the uh, craters here are the smaller ones, the large one, the caldera, the, that was involved, but later eruptions formed these smaller, in the center there is Lago di Albano, uh, the largest one there filled with a lake. All of that is, is Lago di Nemi, and that is filled with water. But they form what are called tough rings, and that's basically lots of energy, very low rim deposits, and uh, deposits going into the outskirts of Rome. Uh, most recent crater is in the Lago di Albano, and it's also a site where there's been a lot of recent uplift, uplift movement, and increased uh, release of carbon dioxide and seismic swarms. So who knows when the next eruption is? We don't know. Uh, most recent eruption of any note are volcanic mud flows, uh, lahars, if you're into, geo, into volcanology, which came out of Lago di Albano and go in toward Rome. And they know the date because it the deposit overlies a Bronze Age settlement which has been being excavated. It's interesting that the Bronze Age settlement where the ex <clears throat> excavation is, is below a large Ikea superstore, which what the Ikea people did was raise the store. And so underneath is a large parking area and you can look at the, the excavation and there's a little museum there. It's very, very tidy. Okay, the deposits that make up the plateau on top of uh, quite often ancient sediments from the Tiber, mostly from the Alban Hills on the east side. There's a sample over there on the left of some of these in a quarry just outside of Rome. Uh, the, uh, they're mostly ignimbrites and form from the fair, fairly large caldera forming eruptions. On the top, and we'll talk about this later, is the Capo di Bovi lava flow from which most of the stone for the streets has been quarried. On the west side, the Sabatini volcanic field, uh, not used quite so much for construction. It's uh, more distant, and, but there's still these deposits that come around the, the uplifted tertiary deposits. How am I doing on time here? Okay, move along. Uh, these ignimbrites, which form the plateaus upon which Rome is built, have left the major building stone, tough, T-U-F-F, not what the architects say, which is tufa, which is not tufa, is a spring deposit, anyhow. Uh, and the Romans excavated these large blocks for construction, but the quarries are underground. These underground quarries were there for a reason. Land at the top was far too valuable <clears throat> for development and for agriculture and too valuable to be used for open quarries. And so these, these underground quarries uh, underlie much of Rome, and uh, it's, a, it's a hazard for a new construction. So before any new construction goes in, they have to go around and drill and look for these things. They're fairly stable because the Roman engineers made sure that, the, that there were large pillars holding these quarries up. Today, they're used for exploration. Some of them were used for churches. And this one I show up here is used for growing mushrooms. And there's an example over on the left with Renato Funicello in the front there, uh, which is uh, one discovered, you know, fairly recent historic time. Um, and you can see the tool marks 
left by the quarrymen, the Roman quarrymen. <clears throat> On the, the bottom right is a, a catacomb, again, carved into the tufts. The tufts are strong as building blocks, but they're easy to quarry. Uh, you can quarry the, most of these tufts with, with a handsaw. It, okay, the catacombs themselves, very, very large, extensive, uh, and uh, essentially they, they, after they stopped using, uh, stopped burning, you know, people, they had to start burying them. So they bury these in these catacombs along with the little holes on the wall there for individuals. Uh, I mentioned that the quarries, they underlie much of Rome. It's, it's just amazing. It's a huge network. And uh, occasionally one collapses and uh, has to be filled. Some, in some cases, they, when they're drilling, they find a quarry, underground quarry that has not been visited and they check it out. And if they want to build something on it, they quite often fill that spot with, with concrete. And that's just a little example of what can happen. Uh, either just too much weight at the surface or possibly leakage from sewers and uh, water lines. Another major uh, product that is unique and was essentially created by Roman engineers is Pozzolano. Pozzolana, is, Pozzolana concrete is made up of aggregates from these altered pyroplastic deposits mixed with cement, lime cement, and uh, makes a very strong concrete and concrete that is resistant to to uh, water and many Roman structures like piers and moles and so on along the sea are made of this, this Pozzolana concrete. This is the Pantheon. Uh, if you wanna see a nice concrete building, not the, build, not the temple in front of it, but the actual Pantheon itself, which is very thick walls of poured concrete. At the top with the dome, they poured, the roof is made of coffers goes up to the loculus, the open light to, at the top. And the, as they go from the base of the dome to the top of the dome, they use different mixes of aggregate, starting with the heaviest lithic bridge aggregates at the base. And when they reach the top, it's the aggregate is pum pumice, so it's very light. Road building. Uh, Basalt, very fine grained basalt that came from the, the Alban Hills and a major lava flow that goes on into the outskirts of Rome. That's the Capo di Bove lava flow. It's called the Capo di Bove because it ends at Cecilia Metelli's tomb, which has a carved bowl on the, on the entrance. And the large blocks, the basoli, were used for major roads. So this is one near the Porta Maggiore, uh, not in very good shape, a lot of erosion from traffic and so on. <clears throat> to the more you know, regular size along the Appian Way. And if you look back at the geologic map, you can see the ancient Appian Way following the lava flow itself and heading out to the south toward uh, Napoli. The, uh, the tiny blocks that you see in Roman streets, the San Pietrini, are also carved of basalt and were carved from the quarries along the Appian Way. But today, most of them are imported from other countries, quite often China. So some of the repairs you see on the, the Roman streets uh, are blocks that aren't Italian. Travertine. Uh, really beautiful stuff. And uh, essentially, if you look at the geologic map, there's Tivoli on the right, actually Rome is off down to the, 
to the left and down. And there's a major strike slip fault that comes out of the Cornicolini Mountains and heads on down. I think it goes underneath the uh, the, Alb the Alban Hills. And as I showed on that historical map, for the last 165,000 years or so, the springs coming up are loaded with carbonate, uh, bicarbonate, and uh, a lot of carbon dioxide, and have been flowing out into this basin, the Aqua Albuli Basin near Tivoli, and leaving beautiful fine grained travertine. And this is a travertine quarry out near Tivoli. And uh, you can see the, the blocks they cut. They're quite often used for mundane things like uh, street curbs and so on. Also, like in the case of the, uh, the Trevi Fountain uh, construction of, and for bridges. This is the Ponte Cestio across the Tiber and uh, all travertine. The, uh, I mentioned that there's a lot of carbon dioxide. So uh, a couple of my associates were visiting the quarries one Saturday near the lake there. And uh, there was an earthquake and a lot of carbon dioxide was released and they ran out of the quarry because they would have been suffocated had they stayed in the quarry. And actually there's a lot of carbon dioxide coming up in the Alban Hills. And occasionally you find a dead animal of some sort. Okay, key to Rome success. Uh, water, lots of it. Throughout Rome, you see these fontanelli, which are just constantly flowing. You can drink it, you can wash your hands in it, you can use it to wash your car, but there's a lot of it. And to show how that has essentially this so the sources which are in the Apennines uh, were developed and essentially drove the, the success of the Roman Empire. At the start, before they started building aqueducts, there were springs within the city. You can, on the, the left are millions of inhabitants. On the right, uh, so you see it be essentially cubic meters of per second of water coming in. Uh, and until they first built the first aqueduct out of the Apennines, the Appian, uh, it didn't grow. There's a, there's a, the broken line is showing population, the solid line is showing water supply. And you can see it kept growing and growing and growing as, the, as more aqueducts were built. And until, the invasion of the quote unquote barbarians, sorry guys, uh, who destroyed a lot of the aqueducts. And part of it was to essentially drive people out of the city that didn't have any water. And so they were back to essentially using small springs uh, in Rome. Why didn't they use the Tiber? Apparently the Tiber was polluted and the water supply was not drinkable. And it wasn't until like the, uh, I think it was the 14th or 15th century that the popes started having the major aqueducts rebuilt. And you can see the rise in the public now. Uh, today, a few of the aqueducts are still used, but most of the, the, the water is coming through steel piping from the same sources in the Apennines. Sources uh, mostly up there were one, two, uh, in the Apennines, karstic terrain. In that karstic terrain are very, you know, very large springs flowing. There's also some water coming in from the Alban Hills to the south and the Sabatini to the north. Today, actually, one of the sources of water coming in from the west is from Lago di Bracciano, up near the top part of the, of the image. Aqueducts, incredible engineering. I mean, the Romans were fabulous engineers and probably still are, but you get up to the source on the Apennines, you collect it and you start running a channel toward Rome, sometimes tens of kilometers through complex terrain. And uh, to keep the flow moving, 
they had to have a, a slope of one meter per kilometer. And they did that, they had surveying instruments that they used successfully. And when they had to dig a tunnel, they had excavation shafts, they had a settling pool, and then on into Rome where the water was distributed. You can go to the aqueduct park just outside Rome and see what's left of many of these aqueducts. One of the reasons they needed so much water is that the, the public loved their thermal baths. This is the Terme de Caracalla, the, the baths of Caracalla. And uh, they had hot water, they had tepid water, they had steam rooms, uh, tremendous construction. On the other side, the not so beneficial water were the floods. The flooding was pretty regular until the mid 20th century. This is Piazza Novota in the flood of 1870. And here's a map of the, the flood itself. You can see the Piazza Venezia down there, uh, St. Saint Peter's on the left. And scattered throughout this region, the Romans had left uh, marks and columns that showed the water depths for various floods. And an example of this is on the Church of Mount Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, that's just across, across the piazza from the Pantheon. And it shows the level of the water in the flood of 1870, which is close to four meters. So if you lived on the floodplain, it was not a good place to be. Okay, the other thing I wanna talk about is debris. Uh, if you, if there's a thick, great thickness of Anthropogenic debris, if you're an engineer, you hate it. If you're an archeologist, you love it. This is in the form of excavating down through the debris into various uh, Roman structures. How thick was it? On the left is the thickness in meters through, is through time. This is in one spot in the Campo Marzio. And you can start in ancient Rome up to, the, up, you know, on up like eight meters, on up to 14 meters, on up to 18 meters, on up to today. So it's, uh, there's a lot of debris. And because of that debris, many of the major monuments and historical buildings look like they're, they've been buried, uh, developed in a, in a pit. This is the, Memorial Pyramid near the Piazza San Paolo, I think, uh, near the English cemetery. And it looks like it's in a hole. It is because the whole the street has actually come up about three, four meters relative to the pyramid. And just another example, the Church of San Clemente uh, looks like it's in a hole. And uh, whereas the, as the rest of its debris now, as I was talking about the San Pietrini, the little basalt blocks that make up many of Rome's streets. You can see examples here down at the bottom of the photograph going into the church. The church itself actually overlies a uh, Roman temple, first century BCE uh, Roman temple. So things keep adding up, building up. Uh, sample here. And developing the metro line, metro line B. This is a geologic section. The man made debris are the slanted lines at the surface. And you can see that it's, it's pretty thick. And there's, if you get down near the Cavour station, there's actually a, a ravine that's filled with 20 meters of debris, and then it goes on down to the Colosseo. Uh, the debris sometimes causes problems. Some of the major buildings, the newer buildings, well, I call this newer, this is the Palazzo Valentini, uh, have problems with sometimes there's subsidence, compression of the debris and they get tilting and they have to fix things up. There's the Trajan's column on the right. Talk about that in a little bit. But the, the major, uh, example is near the, the pyramid, and that's the uh, 
onto Testaccio. And it's close to what was an industrial area in ancient Rome and uh, a dock, docking area for boats coming up the Tiber and bringing uh, wine and oil in amphorae, amphora singular, and used and then the broken ones tossed away. The, the, uh, this rather tall hill is made up of broken, mostly broken amphorae, 53 million of them. Uh, it's uh, pretty spectacular. Today, the mountain is surrounded, or the hill is surrounded by uh, nightclubs and restaurants. Another major uh, problem with Rome are earthquakes. Maybe not so much of a problem if you built properly. And most of the earthquakes occur within the Apennines themselves. Uh, and not too many earthquakes under Rome itself. Uh, but still, the effects are pretty great. And if you look at this map of damage to various historical structures uh, through time, uh, you can see that there's a lot of what I want to point out is that, you know, what these structures are built on, quite often, it's not so much the structure, it's the underlying alluvium or rock or whatever. Uh, the, the Colosseum, you notice, most, well, most people don't notice, sorry, uh, but the Colosseum on one side is beautifully preserved. The other side is a mess. And the reason is not so much that it was quarried by people looking for building stone, but by the fact that the line between the undisturbed and the disturbed part of the structure is right over the boundary between Pleistocene sedimentary rocks and unconsolidated sediments. There was a, a lake there in this valley before the Colosseum was built. And uh, so it's a matter of what you build on, not so much how big the earthquake is. I won't go through this because Jean-Luc is gonna talk about this in session three. It's essentially looking at the columns and the difference between one that's on uh, solid material and one that's on sediments of the Tiber. Won't talk about that. Uh, the Vatican, this is a map of the Vatican. And most of it's on good solid ground and hasn't suffered much in the way of damage due to earthquakes or anything like that. But out in front in the piazza were those beautiful oval piazza with the columns on all sides. Originally it was supposed to have been flanked by two large Campanile bell towers, but because they were on the alluvium of the Tiber, they kept tilting. And finally, they tore them down and Bernini de designed the piazza that you see today. Uh, the large, thick monographs of the Geologia di Roma have been put into uh, by Renato and Guido Giordano into uh, a disc that you can get, I think, still, uh, which shows the geology of, of the, uh, and in the front you have some, some Puti surveying. Uh, yeah, right, okay. Uh, just a sample of, of the geolo geologic maps in that. And the, as a geologist, it, it's appropriate that urban geology, which is uh, a subset of geology, uh, a lot of it in Canada, some of it in the US, some of it elsewhere, it comes from Urbs, which is the ancient name for the city of Rome. And we'll get back to the front where there's Renato Funicello on the left, me in the middle and Donatella Dorita. After my term there on my sabbatical, we wrote a book called The Seven Hills of Rome. And a year or two later with Maurizio Perotto, he set the coli. Uh, which actually in Italy won a literary prize. Can you believe that for a geology book? So anyhow, thank you, Renato, the late Renato Funicello. And uh, 
for introducing me to a remarkable time in my life. Bye. Thank you so much, Grant, for this presentation. Uh, Let me stop the share. Hang on. Yeah, you are. Yeah. I'm trying to. Okay. <laughs> Right there. Just, just to know, it's uh, I, I know that there is actually a student in Greece in uh, who is who are watching your presentation. And some weeks ago, they were in Roma, learning in Erasmus Plus uh, Roma and Geology of Roma. So it's uh, unbelievable for for them to to have a lecture today after their travel in Roma, and so they are completely. Uh, um, completely, uh, okay. it's fine for them to to have these two things uh, in a in a few in a few time uh, period. So thank you for them and thank you for all the teachers. They, I think they they learn a lot about the the city of Rome. As you said, there there will be a hands-on activity about the. Um, the column of Marc Aurelius and uh, Trajan uh, Colon and uh, earthquakes, of course. But uh, maybe if some teacher have question to grant, please, you are welcome to, to ask the, your question. So. <laughs> uh, I apologize, there's a lot more yeah. to talk about, but I only had 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. You are on, on, on time. Uh, it's okay. So if you have some question, is it's it's nice. Uh, but I, I I look in the chat if there is something. Uh, mm, check the chat. <laughs> check the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Grant, I have, a, I have a, uh, a question. You have seen, uh, we have seen a, a map with a flute. Uh, I don't remember when exactly. And if, um, and we see in, in gray the, the, zoo, the, the area with the flute. So that means that this, this area is the bed of the Tiber River, or that means that in this gray area is alluvial deposit only in Roma. Yeah, the the uh, the gray area I think was mostly uh, just alluvium from the Tiber, which yeah. as as sea level rose, the Tiber started really doing some serious deposition because the channels there were, were very deep at the at when the sea level was lowest, and. Uh, <clears throat> It's not terribly solid. There's a building, I can't remember the name of it. It's a major government facility along the banks of the Tiber. And uh, they keep having to repair it because it's on alluvium. And a lot of the columns keep falling over. So it's, it's a matter of uh, the Romans themselves, they, they built in great places. And they rarely built on the Tiber floodplain because of the floods. Yeah, and at that time, most of the the uh, sites down there were for, you know, military training and things like that. Which, if it flooded, it was like so what? So, anyhow. Okay. Um, so I cannot see more question. I, I have one more, but <laughs> uh, it was about the earthquake. Uh, we know that there were a lot of earthquakes in the second century or after the imperial uh, period, but. How we know this? We have archive, or are just um, looking at the monument, or things like that. No, so actually, there are archives. Or in the case of uh, of the Colosseum, there was yeah. damage, and then it was rebuilt. And there's a plaque in the Colosseum that refers to an earthquake that caused the damage, and to the the gentleman who paid for the the, the restoration. Okay, so we we collect that uh, we collect uh, information like this by uh, uh, yeah. this kind and, of uh, event. Mm. There's there's translations of oh, God, what's his name uh, the famous Roman engineer is it Vitruvius I think that's right 
and he wrote everything, including very detailed accounts on how to build a road. Uh, but uh, he, his book, I have it here in translation somewhere, uh, was uh, just phenomenal for the time. Because he described, uh, but he described not the the earthquake. He described the uh, uh, restoration. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. So once more again, uh, thanks you very much, Grant, for this presentation. I think it was uh, very appreciated by uh, our teacher. So I have some. Uh, um, I can see in the chat uh, that the presentation was very clear. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And now I think we have uh, Matthew uh, from Saskatchewan, so from Canada. So I think Matthew is with us. I think so, Matthew. Yeah, hello. I'm yeah, here. hello, hello, Matthew. Hi. Hello. It's the morning for you, I guess. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and we we are going to to finish your first session of gift with you. So you are from University of Saskatchewan, right? That's and correct. you want to talk about climate, uh, societal impact of some volcano or some volcanic period, right? Exactly. Yes. So Matthew, uh, I'm. Happy to welcome you, and uh, so let's go to to your presentation. I think you can share your screen because uh, okay, I have yeah, done. Do that. And we we hear you. We are going to hear you very uh, very soon. <laughs> Good. Can you see my title slide now? Yeah, we can see. You okay. can see. yes, we can see a volcano with a eruptive. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, let me also start my timer because it's always helpful for me to, to be able to see. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be taking part in this. I think it's a really great idea um, to be to be sharing knowledge with uh, um, with teachers and educators. Um, my uh, my parents were both teachers and educators, um, and uh, have a lot of conversations about education. I just think it's great to be. Uh, to be connecting, you know, some some cutting edge science, what's happening now in the world of science, with with teachers, and and see that knowledge uh, transferred down to the to the next generation. Um, I'm going to be talking today about, um, uh, as was just said, about uh, climatic and societal impacts of um, particular volcanic events um, in the uh, Middle Ages, um, and then this is really a, an example of of um, interdisciplinary research. So my background is in physics. I'm in the uh, Department of Physics and Engineering Physics at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I studied uh, atmospheric physics, so um, the radiative transfer and the composition of the stratosphere. Um, and through this project, um, I got to do some really fun science, uh, taking some of my expertise and applying it to a problem that can only be applied or only be attacked in an interdisciplinary way. So it got me to um, to, to interact and work with um, uh, historians and people who uh, uh, drill ice cores and reconstruct past climate. And anyways, I'll get into it and, and, um, and, and we'll see how that works along the way. So the start of this story um, comes to us from documentary evidence. Um, so, so things that were written down uh, about what was happening in the year 536. So this is, um, uh, I'm no historian, but uh, in, from what I understand, this is the, the Roman Empire um, had, had um, uh, reached its height and then was in some sort of decline, um, a slow decline. And um, sometimes the Roman Empire would, would uh, get organized and have a little bit of advance, but generally things were declining. And then in the year 536, weird stuff started to happen. And one of those things um, was, was documented by a number of observers throughout Europe, so written down, and we can, we can read uh, what they wrote down about this year. Um, so things like this, the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it shed were nor such at it as it is accustomed to shed. 
another observer, Zacharias of Maitilene, I don't, probably not um, pronouncing that right, but uh, he was writing down, he was in Constantinople at the time, and he wrote, the sun began to be darkened by day and the moon by night from the 24th of March in this year until the 24th of June in the following year. Uh, another observer uh, wrote down that the sun was dark and its darkness lasted for 18 months. Each day it shone for about four hours and still this light was but a feeble shadow. And then we get to the most important part, the fruits did not ripen and the wine tasted like sour grapes. So here we have like, and again, these are just a couple of examples, but we have um, uh, clear evidence that something was going on with the sunlight. It wasn't as tense a, as usual. Um, so that's a, a huge key bit of evidence for us. Um, but it turns out there was a number of other things going on at the time. So if you look through different um, documentary evidence from different parts of the world, this seems like a very important time in, in history for a number of reasons. Um, there was um, famines widespread. So um, uh, documentary evidence in Ireland of a failure of bread. Um, there's evidence of cold and heavy snowfalls in Baghdad. China reports of summer frosts and snow, widespread famine. Um, yeah, crop failures and famines in the Mediterranean. And then to top it all off, a few years later in, in the year 541 CE is when the first plague pandemic started in Europe. Um, in Scandinavia, there are no written records, but there is um, archeological evidence that uh, points to huge changes in the mid uh, 500s or, or sixth century. Um, abandoned settlements, uh, decrease in agriculture, um, and these sacrificial gold offerings where people now find hordes of gold that were buried around this time, uh, seemingly as some sort of um, sacrifice to the gods um, to, to improve the situation. And so there's some idea that this is connected to all these climatic um, uh, instances that we're seeing around this time. And so a lot of this is um, um, all summarized in a, in a book by David Keyes, um, which is very interesting to read. Um, he probably extrapolates a little bit further than what most scientists would, but there's a lot of interesting things um, in world history going on at this time. Um, and so the question becomes, could this be connected to what we just talked about, the, the decrease in the intensity of sunlight that was noted by some observers? So let's look into physical um, evidence. So um, uh, the natural sciences, um, can, we, can we get anything from that? Well, you might be uh, familiar with the idea of um, that tree rings are a recorder of um, climatic conditions. So if you look at the, um, the width of a tree ring, so every, every year, every summer, a tree builds a ring and the width of that ring gives you um, um, information about the, um, the growing conditions for the tree. Uh, which in some locations and for some trees um, is very tightly correlated with the temperature um, during the growth, growing season. So if you pick the right trees in the right locations, uh, look at the width of those tree rings over time um, and count them back. Since the tree puts down a ring for every year, you can count back in time and, and have very good time resolution and then use the width of the tree ring um, as a measure of, of the temperature. Um, and so if you do that with, um, in this case, this is from a, a study in 2008, um, where they looked at um, uh, seven different locations in Europe and averaged them all together, uh, put together a time series that looks like this. And so this is a, a sort of proxy for temperature. So um, larger values mean warm temperatures and colder or negative values mean cold temperatures. Um, and you'll see that the largest deviation from sort of mean conditions happens right around here in the middle of the sixth century. And so if we zoom in on that, um, that time period, what we see is a very sharp decrease in temperature in the year 536, and then a long um, duration negative value. So over a decade of colder than, than normal temp temperatures. And so this is really um, common in, in tree ring time series that go back this far in time. So you can, there's a number of papers that have noted this um, and, and very much the strongest temperature deviation um, that, that comes out of these, of these proxy records. Um, as an aside, um, you'll see some other cold temperatures uh, that happen in, later in the time series. Um, and 
those happen to be associated, we know, with volcanic eruptions. So there was a, uh, an eruption of Hoyana Patina in the year 1600, and you see very um, cold temperatures um, represented in this, in this temperature time series. And the eruption of Tambora in 1815 also shows up quite strongly in this time series. Tambora famous um, for creating what has been called the year without a summer in 1816 in Europe, um, where the um, conditions were cold and rainy, especially in, in Switzerland, leading to the um, famines and, and um, uh, deaths of, of many people. So here, just let's summarize with two main questions that come up to this point. Um, so first of all, what caused this mystery cloud in 536 that uh, diminished the, the um, intensity of sunlight? Um, and secondly, was that cloud responsible for the climate and societal downturn that's apparent in um, both documentary and archaeological evidence throughout the Northern Hemisphere? So as I just noted, um, we do see these temperature decreases um, uh, associated with, with volcanic eruptions. So if we're looking at this, um, um, this situation, volcanic eruptions have to be sort of our prime suspect here. Um, there are other possibilities, um, uh, a meteor impact um, or, or asteroid impact, a comet. Uh, um, these, these ideas have been put forth in the past. Um, and for a long time, it was hard to attribute um, this event to a volcanic eruption, but only just in the last few years has that been um, uh, convincingly done, and I'll get into that. But first, I want to talk just a couple of minutes about volcanic eruptions and why um, they might be the prime suspect for, for explaining what was going on in this situation. So volcanic eruptions, as you know, they erupt and put lots of material into the atmosphere. Um, you see these gigantic clouds. Um, most of that is um, ash, so bits of, of, um, of rock uh, in, in very small amounts that, that come out of the um, atmosphere relatively quickly. There's a lot of um, water vapor as well. Um, but from a climatic um, um, perspective, the most important thing that's released by volcanic eruptions is sulfur. Um, and so that comes in the form of sulfur dioxide, SO2. And it turns out that if the eruption is so large that the eruption plume reaches into the stratosphere, then that has a um, very strong impact on climate. Um, what happens is that SO2 gets oxidized and turns into sulfuric acid, and sulfuric acid will condense into tiny little particles, what we call aerosols. Um, and those particles, again, little liquid drops, but tiny, like um, on the order of um, microns, so um, uh, 10, 10 to the minus six meters, right? Like so really, really small. Um, and they spread out through the atmosphere and um, they are good at scattering uh, radiation. So the incoming light from the, from the sun is scattered. Some of that gets scattered back into space. Um, so that decreases the amount of radiation that reaches the surface of the earth. Um, and that can lead to a cooling of the surface. Uh, those aerosol particles also absorb long-wave radiation, which is emitted from the Earth, and so that leads to a warming of the stratosphere where those particles are. So eventually, those particles will be transported through the atmosphere, and they'll, they'll um, come down back into the troposphere, the lower part of the atmosphere, um, where, the, where they will be um, uh, scavenged. The, the, the aerosol particles will grow because there's a lot of water vapor in the, in the troposphere, um, and they'll get deposited to the surface. Some of that will be deposited to the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. And so then as ice is always being formed as new snow falls in, um, in those ice sheets, um, that sulfur will be still um, present in that ice sheet. And so when scientists go and drill these ice cores um, and, and um, uh, drill a long ice core that's basically going back in time as you go through each layer of the ice, you'll find a spike in sulfur um, that's associated with these past volcanic eruptions. So let's talk just a little bit about, about the, um, the impacts of, of those sulfur um, particles in the stratosphere. Um, I want to give you just a tiny taste of um, atmospheric physics here, or, or climate physics to be more um, precise. Um, the, the, um, the Earth is heated through the absorption of sunlight, right? That's the only, um, or the, the most important way that the Earth uh, maintains a temperature that's above that of, of other planets like, like Mars, right? 
um, sorry, that's how the, the Earth is heated, is the absorption of sunlight. Um, so if you imagine you have incoming sunlight coming in, warming the Earth, then you have a uh, radiation that's emitted by the Earth that goes out to space. Um, and in a set steady state, we expect that the um, radiation collected by the Earth is equal to the radiative power emitted by the Earth. So if I write a couple of equations, uh, we can say here, here's our, that statement written down mathematically. Um, the incoming radiative power, which we call shortwave radiation from the sun, is equal to the outgoing longwave radiation uh, emitted from the Earth. We can now write these things down a little bit more um, concretely. If S0 is the um, um, uh, flux coming from the sun, um, and it's being absorbed by an area um, pi r squared, where r is the radius of the Earth, um, and then we have this factor of alpha, which is the albedo of the Earth. I should go down, so we have a couple of things. Oh, and I have a typo, this should be alpha down here. I changed my, my uh, variable terms. So this planetary albedo, which I call alpha up here, is, um, tells you the amount of radiation which is just immediately reflected back into space due to clouds, due to ice, things like that. So that, that's the amount that's not absorbed by the Earth. Good. And then on the right hand side, we have terms which are related to the temperature of the Earth. So the warmer the Earth is, the more radiation it emits to space. Um, and it turns out that we know that this relationship goes as the fourth power of the temperature of the Earth. Um, and that's emitted by the entire surface area of the Earth. Anyways, we can take these equations now and simplify them a little bit and solve for this effective temperature of the Earth. And we get this relationship here. So we can see that this temperature, this effective temperature of the Earth is related to really only two things, S0, which is the amount of radiation coming from the sun, and this term alpha, the albedo. So that's really key. If we change this alpha, the albedo of the Earth, the amount that's reflected, then that leads to a change in the temperature. And so you can use this very, very simple relationship to calculate that, for example, a 1% change in the albedo would lead to a temperature change of the Earth of around 0.3 degrees Celsius. So as an example, like um, a sort of visual example, imagine that for some reason, the Earth just becomes a little hazy, the atmosphere, right? You have more of these aerosol particles, oops. It comes a little hazy and from space, if you're looking at the Earth, it would become a little bit brighter. And so that means that more radiation is being reflected from the, um, from the Earth, and so then less is being absorbed at the surface, and then your surface temperature would go down. Good. Okay, so how do we know that volcanic eruptions really are, are important for climate? Um, so our most recent example of a very large eruption which had this kind of impact on climate um, was in 1991, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Um, and I wrote down a few numbers associated with this eruption because I find them quite um, impressive. So this eruption ejected 10 cubic kilometers of material out of the earth into the atmosphere. It's a huge volume of material. Um, the column height um, of that, that plume reached 25 kilometers, so well into the stratosphere. Um, and the emissions, the gas emissions from that um, eruption, uh, we have a very large amount of water vapor, carbon dioxide, as well as sulfur dioxide and some other, other species. It turns out that this amount of water vapor and carbon dioxide are pretty negligible compared to the amount that's already in the atmosphere. Um, yeah, just to put some, some units on here. So these are all uh, listed in teragrams um, and one teragram is equal to a billion kilograms or in other words, a million metric tons. So these are really large um, masses of, of gases put into the atmosphere from this eruption. Um, so, as I said, the amount of water vapor and CO2 is pretty negligible compared to the amount that's already in the, in the atmosphere, but this amount of SO2, sulfur dioxide, is quite significant. Um, it works out to be about 10 to 20 percent of the modern global annual anthropogenic SO2 emissions, so what we're putting out um, because of pollution. Um, but most importantly, um, about this eruption is, so there's a lot, fairly large amount of SO2, but the fact that it gets into the stratosphere um, really is important for this climate impact. Um, and the reason for that, which I've alluded to earlier, um, is that the stratosphere compared to the troposphere is extremely dry. So this plot is showing you um, both the temperature um, as a function of height above the surface. So the temperature is in these kind of dotted lines 
Um, and you see that the troposphere, the temperature decreases with height um, until you reach a minimum at the tropopause here. And then it's relatively constant. It will actually start to increase a little bit with height as you get into the stratosphere. That's what defines the troposphere versus stratosphere. Um, but because of that, the water vapor mixing ratio changes quite dramatically as well. Um, I'm going to get my laser pointer here. This helps a little bit. Um, so you see that in the, in the black solid line here, we have the profile of water vapor as a function of height of surface. It's also decreasing with height, but this is a log scale in the bottom. So we're seeing orders of magnitude difference in water vapor mixing ratio as we go from the, the surface of the Earth into the stratosphere. And that's important in our, in our case because these little sulfate aerosol or, or sulfuric acid um, aerosol particles that form in the stratosphere from the sulfur put in by the volcanic eruption, um, if they were in the troposphere where it's very wet, they would just grow, water would condense onto the particles, they would grow larger, and then they would have a gravitational settling velocity that would just pull them down to the, to the ground. But in the stratosphere, they stay small, and so they're able to float within the stratosphere for a very long time. Good. So what's shown here now is um, temperature of the lower troposphere. So um, um, uh, measurements from satellites of the um, temperature of the first couple of kilometers of the, of the troposphere down where we, where we live um, from around 1980 to 2012 or something like that. So concentrate on the blue and red lines here. You'll see that that temperature kind of fluctuates from year to year. Sometimes it gets a little warmer. Sometimes it's a little bit colder. Um, but, and we'd like to understand why it does those things. Is that just um, um, random variations or are some of them forced from um, uh, the result of, of something? Um, it, it helps if we look at this time series, if we um, remove the effects of El Nino. So you may have heard of El Nino, um, temp ocean temperatures in the Pacific kind of go up and down in some um, cycle and this can really affect the global mean um, surface temperature. So, but we can statistically kind of remove that from our time series. Um, and then we see a time series that looks like this um, in the bottom. And what we see here now quite a bit clearly is the impact that this volcanic eruption of Pinatubo in 1991 had on, on global temperatures. So we see a decrease here of around 0 0.8 degrees. And this, again, this kind of average temperature of the first couple of kilometers of the, uh, of the troposphere. There was also a fairly large eruption back in 1982, um, El Chichon in Mexico, and we can see that it also had an impact on, on temperatures. If we go further back in time, um, we see this um, effect as well. So if we look at um, uh, proxy-based temperature reconstructions of the temperature of the last millennium here, so that's on the bottom panel I'm showing here, um, and these proxy-based temperature reconstructions are in this sort of gray shading. So you have a lot of different proxies and they give you different information. So you build a bit of a, um, a range, a likelihood range of where, what temperature was like uh, as we go back in the past. So this is a Northern Hemisphere mean. So we're just kind of averaging the temperature over the full Northern Hemisphere um, and looking at it as a function of time as we go back in time. Um, so if you follow just this gray shading, you see that there was colder periods um, and um, cold decades. Um, and then as we go back in time further into the Middle Evil times, uh, things seemed like they were a little bit warmer. Um, and it turns out that a lot of these cold periods, and especially the cold years and cold decades, um, line up very nicely with when we think there were these large volcanic eruptions in the past. So on the top here, we have an estimate of volcanic um, radiative forcing um, from, from archives that um, uh, record the timing and magnitude of past volcanic eruption. And so you'll see these periods again here. This is um, uh, this Tambora eruption in 1815 and a couple of other strong eruptions that happened around similar time period. And you can see the impact that that had on, on temperatures. I should mention uh, that the red and blue lines in the bottom plot um, come from climate model simulations, which use this time series of volcanic forcing. Um, and that those simulations then produce fairly good agreement with the proxy-based temperature reconstructions, which are in the, it's in the gray shading. So I've talked a little bit about these volcanic eruptions and climate and, and uh, tried to say that it's kind of a prime suspect for what happened in the year 536. 
Um, so usually how, these, um, how we have information about past volcanic eruptions come from ice cores, I've mentioned. So as the scientists go to, um, to Greenland or Antarctica and they drill these ice cores into the, uh, into the ice, um, and then they can do a sort of chemical analysis along the length of the ice um, and um, get a sense of, of what was in the atmosphere as we go back in time, any particular year in the past. Um, and if, then if you do analysis and look for sulfur along the length of an ice core, you'll get time series that might look like this along the top plot here. And you'll see again these spikes in sulfur amount in the ice core. Um, and these turn out to be predominantly because of past volcanic eruptions, okay? Um, and so if we look at time series for both Greenland and Antarctica, so on the top is a time series from, from Greenland. On the very bottom here, we have a time series from Antarctica. Sometimes we find peaks that line up very well between both hemispheres. So Greenland and Antarctica both have a, a spike in their sulfate in the, around the year 574 or 575. So this is evidence of a volcanic eruption that happened in the tropics, so in the low latitude, and the sulfur was able to spread throughout the whole globe and then be deposited both um, in, in both hemispheres, in Greenland and, and Antarctica. Um, in other cases, you'll find a spike just in one of the two hemispheres. So here we find a spike in the year 536 in the Greenland ice cores, but no corresponding um, spike in, in Antarctica. So this is evidence of an eruption that happened in the northern hemisphere, and its sulfate aerosols were mostly contained within the, within the northern hemisphere. Um, Right, so here um, I should kind of mention this study was, was monumental in the year 2015 because it corrected a dating error um, that had been in the ice cores for, for decades um, uh, up to this point. Um, and so it was the first time that these time series all got shifted by a few years. And so it was the first time that we were able to see uh, these sulfur peaks in the ice cores line up exactly in time with the tree ring anomalies, the sort of proxy for surface temperature. Um, which is shown in the middle panel here. So here's some um, tree ring growth anomalies that have this very um, strong negative um, anomaly in the year 536 and then for decades afterwards. And so here for the first time, we were really able to prove uh, that, the, that these um, temperature anomalies could be connected to volcanic eruptions and particularly two volcanic eruptions, one in the year 536, which was probably Northern hemisphere since its signal shows up only in Greenland um, and then a second eruption that happened in 540, where its sulfur is found in both Antarctica and Greenland, um, giving us evidence of a tropical eruption, like I said, that spreads its sulfur um, uh, throughout the globe. And then another eruption uh, a couple of decades later in 574 or 575. So, so that's the, um, basically the standpoint now that we really, we know that it was a volcanic eruption that happened around this time. So this, um, uh, almost definitely explains the, um, the diminishment of sunlight that um, observers um, um, wrote about in, in the year 536. Um, but it's asking the question of whether that um, uh, eruption and, and the sulfur cloud um, was responsible for the climate and societal downturns that we saw in the Northern Hemisphere is, is a little bit trickier, right? It's, it seems likely, but how do we prove it? Um, and especially, more subtle question is um, some historians and others have looked at the records, especially in the Mediterranean, um, that mention the 536 mystery cloud. Um, and this author suggests that um, from, from what they were able to read, they saw that this mystery cloud was connected to bad harvests for one or two years. Um, and people treated it as like a temporary bad omen, but not the beginning of a long period of unfavorable climatic conditions, you know? So it didn't seem like any clear crisis in the Mediterranean. Um, so, so how do we make sense of this where it was you know, um, observable, but not a big deal in the Mediterranean, but seems like in other locations, um, it was a crisis that might have you know, had a, um, wiped out or, or uh, considerably um, uh, uh, death and famine. OK, so, so here's the situation. Um, I'm running a little short on time because I've talked too much. Um, but we have a, a number of different evidence from a number of different um, fields, right? We have ice core records um, of er volcanic eruptions in the years 536 and 540. We have um, tree rings showing cooling in this period. Uh, we also have the contemporary chronicles that talked about the diminishment of sunlight. And we have archaeological evidence um, of 
population decline um, and other things, particularly um, uh, in Scandinavia is one place where this seems particularly strong, but other locations as well. So how do we bring these things all together and try and get a sense of this, how much this event uh, really impacted the climate and, and societies? Um, well, what we're, we're, what we're going to do is use um, climate models, use representations of the atmosphere and climate um, to kind of bring these things together. In particular, we're going to use the ice cores and the chronicles to get a sense of the volcanic forcing, the amount of aerosol in the stratosphere and its impact on radiation. Then we'll use that in the climate model to um, estimate the climatic response. So changes in temperature um, and so forth, and then use that to try and um, understand how that might have impacted societies. So what is a climate model? So in general, scientists use models to represent um, empirical objects, the world around us, phenomenon, um, using physical processes in a logical and objective way. So that means particularly, or in many cases, of using a little bit of math, right? And it's important to know that models are a simplified reflection of reality, that despite a number of approximations can be extremely useful for understanding the, the thing that you're, that you're modeling, the thing that you're trying to understand. Um, so you've actually met a climate model already. Um, that's the um, couple of uh, lines of math that I introduced earlier, which gave us a, uh, an idea of the effective temperature of the Earth as a function of the incoming solar radiation and this albedo, right? So this is extremely simple. We've made a huge amount of assumptions, including the fact that it does not include an atmosphere at all, which is really, really important. But it still was a little useful for us because we got an order of magnitude estimate of how the surface temperature or the temperature of the Earth would change for a small change in albedo. So that's, it's useful, even though it's simple. Um, what, what I'll be talking about more here, what is now kind of called comprehensive climate models, um, which um, are, are generally large um, computer programs uh, that simulate the movement of mass and energy throughout the Earth system. So that's the atmosphere, but also the ocean and um, land surface um, and, and even other things. Um, so these, again, huge, computer codes run on some of the world's fastest supercomputers, um, and they're used in these climate change projections. Um, so the, um, uh, to, to get a sense of where climate will go in the, in the future, right? Uh, so the first model I'm using is, an aerosol, is a model of the stratospheric aerosol itself, um, the physics of how those aerosol particles form and how they're spread out through the atmosphere. Um, and so I'll give you just a video of, uh, of how that looks. Um, if you run a simulation like that, so here's a simulation of a kind of an eruption in the um, uh, Central America. Uh, the plot is showing you aerosol optical depth, so how much light is being attenuated as it makes its way through the atmosphere because of those aerosol particles. Um, and you can see how the particles are being um, uh, transported around the globe. They stay within the tropics for a good amount of time, but then start to um, be transported into the extra tropics, particularly into the northern hemisphere in these first few months of this simulation. Um, eventually, they'll start to come into the southern hemisphere as well. Um, right. So, so by running that kind of simulation, we can get a sense of how much light is being attenuated by these aerosol particles as a function both of, of space on the globe um, and time. Um, and for, to run those kind of simulations, we just need um, estimates of how large the volcanic eruption was um, and where it was. Uh, we can get estimates of how large the eruption was based on the amount of sulfur that we find in the, in the ice cores. Um, and so um, based on some just uh, some little scaling functions, we can estimate the amount of sulfur, um, sulfur dioxide injected by these eruptions. Uh, so for the two eruptions, one in 536 and one in 540. Um, and then from the, um, the amount, the relative amount in Greenland and Antarctica, we can get a kind of rough sense of where those er eruptions may have been, um, which is useful for our simulations. So one other important point here was that, um, the, like I was saying, the height of the eruption plume is very important. And we did some simulations with this model um, because one of the things that was that's really phenomenal about this about this eruption seems to be this fact that the, the light was diminished for up to 18 months, right? We saw that in some of the, um, the documentary evidence that was written down. And that is really phenomenal. And what we found by doing some simulations was that that's really only possible if that eruption plume is really high in the atmosphere. So if we um, inject the, our sulfur to 23 kilometers, which is the blue line here, 
we find that the diminishment of sunlight lasts considerably longer than if the eruption was at, for example, 18 or 15 kilometers. Um, so here we were able actually to use that documentary evidence to um, give us um, information about the height of the plume in the atmosphere. So we, uh, we, we use 23 kilometers for our injection height, uh, the latitudes and the amounts that I talked about before, and ran simulations uh, to get a, a feeling of for the aerosol optical depth, um, producing um, a plot that looks like this. And so what you'll see is that um, what's particularly um, coming out or, or evident about these eruptions uh, is that the the forcing, the amount of aerosol was heavily concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere for both the 536 and 540 eruptions, which perhaps helps to explain um, their strong impact um, in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm going to skip over that for a second. Um, the next step then is to use that information in a, in a comprehensive climate model. Um, again, one that includes the atmosphere and ocean and a number of other important parts of the climate system or Earth system. Um, and then use that um, information that we've gleaned from the aerosol um, model into the full climate model. And when we do that, then this is a, um, a, a plot of the results where we're showing the Northern Hemisphere mean temperature anomaly. So how much temperature has been changed because of this um, series of two volcanic eruptions. Um, and we see hemispheric mean temperature anomalies that reach up to two degrees Celsius um, after the 540 eruption, which is a huge amount compared to the natural variability of, of, um, of the Earth, right? This is extremely cold. Um, and so on the bottom here now are maps showing how that um, those temperature changes are distributed over the, over the globe. Um, and we see in summer, northern hemisphere in summer, we see a concentration of these cold temperatures in um, sort of the 40 to 45 degree north latitude range. So that actually includes the Mediterranean. Uh, but we, we also see strong temperature changes up in, in northern, uh, northern Europe. In winter, the situation is fairly similar, although now the temperature anomalies are really concentrated over the high latitudes, um, especially over regions where we have um, ice sheets normally um, or sea ice. Uh, we can compare the simulated temperature anomalies with what we see in the tree ring, so the, the proxy reconstructions, and actually these uh, comparisons turn out to be extremely nice, especially for the 536 eruption. So you notice on these plots, uh, now the, um, the simulations are in gray and the um, tree ring temperature uh, uh, time series are in blue, and you'll see in a number of places, perfect agreement for the 536 eruption. Um, some places it's a little bit further off, which can happen. Um, there's uncertainties in both the, um, in the tree ring reconstructions and, and obviously in our forcing as well. Uh, but these, this agreement is extremely encouraging. You'll notice that there is some disagreement um, between the simulations and the tree rings as we um, get into the later time period here. Our simulations seem to return back to normal conditions a little bit faster than the tree rings. Um, and so this is a, still an open question, exactly what's going on here. Um, is our model missing something? Um, that might actually prolong the impact of the eruptions. Um, so this is still, still an open question. Um, the last part of the puzzle here, and I'll have to try and really be quick, is to try and connect these things to, to society, right? Um, and so we've taken, I think, just a small step, but an important step in trying to do that. Um, and so what we could do is our use, use our simulations to calculate um, something that's more um, connected to, to um, agriculture and, and um, uh, cultivation. And so the first step in doing that is to calculate something called a growing degree day. So that you basically just take um, your um, um, temperature time series, even uh, daily mean temperatures, um, and sum them up. So there's a number of crops that you just need a certain amount of heat over a growing season in order to make a particular crop or to grow to, to fruition, right? So if the temperatures were too cold through the, cold, through the growing season, you wouldn't be able that that crop, whether it's wheat or barley or something like that, um, wouldn't get enough heat during the growing season in order to produce its, um, um, its seeds. Um, and so this can be connected to um, something called a cultivation suitability index, um, which just basically tells you, um, gives you an idea of, of how, um, um, uh, how well an area is um, suited for um, cultivating um, crops 
based on its temperature. So when we applied this um, concept to our simulations, what we found is that the change in this cultivation suitability index was really concentrated in a particular latitude range right around Scandinavia. So right where we have this archeological evidence of, um, of sacrificial gold offerings and changes in settlement um, and so, so forth, which are kind of indicated by these uh, colorful dots and the locations where those things have been found. Um, they happen right where we find this large change in this um, cultivation suitability index. And what's probably most important is because we have these two eruptions closely spaced in time in 536 and 540, we'd have potentially a number of years with very strong changes in this cultivation suitability index. So in some locations up to four years um, where the, this index would, would be um, significantly decreased. Um, so I think this is we're trying to connect it to a societal aspect, which is, you know, people could probably deal with one bad harvest, one year of bad harvest. You, might, you have some reserves, you have livestock, which you can um, which can get you through. But if you have two, three, four years of bad harvests, this is going to be um, extremely hard on people. Um, and this also tells us potentially a little bit about why um, they um, did not notice such drastic um, crises in the Mediterranean, because the um, change in the cultivation suitability index was potentially was, was there, but it was small. And you didn't have this um, multiple years of, of changes in, in um, uh, cultivation, whereas in the northern, most um, further north in, in Europe, you did have um, large changes. So this is just one example of, of collaborative work um, investigating these eruptions, um, and and ongoing work is looking at lots of different aspects of this, um, and especially a lot of that is connected to this working group um, called Volcanic Impact on Climate and Society. So quickly, a couple of conclusions. Um, so we um, reconstructed a plausible eruption and radiative forcing history for these eruptions uh, based on natural archives, but also quantitative documentary data, which was extremely useful in this case. Um, we ran climate model simulations, um, which showed um, maximum northern hemisphere mean temperature anomalies of about minus two degrees uh, and showed really good agreement with the available tree ring reconstructions. Um, and we've, like I said, taken a step to try and um, interpret those climate model results in terms of their impact on societies, where we can see, we think, good evidence for multiple years of crop failure in Scandinavia um, and minimal impact on agriculture in the Mediterranean. So to learn more, um, I put here just a link. This is all published in a paper from a few years ago. There's going to be a number of talks later in this workshop um, talking about volcanic eruptions and, and society, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and there's also, um, we've been working within this working group, VIX, we've been um, putting together a special issue in the journal Climate of the Past, um, uh, which collects a number of articles on different aspects that are related to, to what I've been talking about, uh, particularly one that's um, uh, in, uh, under review at the moment, which continues this conversation about the 536 and 540W volcanic level event, and uh, particularly its impact on Scandinavian societies. So. Um, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to, to check out those, um, uh, this special issue in that article in, in particular. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Sorry, I've gone a little over time, but uh, nobody told me to shut up. So um, I hope that's okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. It's okay for a presentation. It's the reason why I said nothing. It was uh, so interesting. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe... We can have some questions from the from the teacher. Um, so you have a, you have a question in the chat, Matthew. Okay. Uh, can you can you yeah. have a look? Okay. Let's see. I saw I see one from okay. Hisashi. So, yeah, yeah. Hisashi um, said uh, some question for you. Yeah. So which kind okay. of uh, tree so, rings you have used? So, and, uh, yeah, let me talk about the tree rings a little bit more. Yeah, you, um, okay. Go back to the relevant slide. There we go. So, okay, so good question. question first uh, question from Hirashi is, um, which tree rings have been used for this figure? Um, that's a good point. I should have been more clear about this. This is a collection of, of seven different locations uh, throughout Europe. 
Um, so um, there's a, a few from, from northern Scandinavia. Um, I think there's one from, um, from the Alps that goes into here as well. Uh, potentially kind of northern Russia, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, so definitely weighted to, to Europe and, and probably heavily weighted to northern Europe. It turns out that, um, that, that a lot of tree reconstructions, you're looking for a place where the tree is, um, where temperature is the limiting factor in the growth of the tree. And so this tends to be on, on the sort of edge of the temperature distribution of the tree. So they tend to come from the sort of northern latitudes a lot. Although sometimes that can happen if you're on a mountain. And so you have trees that are right at the location um, where uh, the temperature from year to year can be um, um, lower or higher and critical for the growth of that tree. So that's, I think, my understanding of uh, like why a lot of them come from the northern, um, high northern latitudes or, or from mountain regions. Um, so it, was it unrivaled in all over tree rings all over the world oh, yeah. or in some parts? Another good question. So um, we would love to find out more information about 536 and its impact on the southern hemisphere. Unfortunately, there are there's a limitation of tree rings in the southern hemisphere. There's just not as many good locations to to um, to get them, um, and. And so I'm not aware at this point of any good evidence for its impact in, in the Southern Hemisphere, but we're hoping for more data on that uh, to be coming up soon. A lot of uh, scientists are, are working on collecting more data in, in Northern Hemisphere, but it definitely in, in North America, um, we do see this as well. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. One more question here I see from, um, how have, how have you calculated the Z-score? Yeah, so good question. What is this Z-score? It's a little bit weird. Um, so it's not exactly temperature. I've talked about it as if it's temperature, um, but it's kind of a, a proxy for temperature. A proxy, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Z-score is basically just a statistical thing that's like, um, it's like the standard deviation, multiples of the standard deviation. So if you have a long time series and it goes up and down, you can calculate a, a mean, of course, but you can also calculate a standard deviation. And so then if you divide your time series by the standard deviation, what you get is this z-score. So if a, a value is two, it means that it's two standard deviations away from the mean value. Um, so it kind of shows you like how common it is or how unlikely. So um, a, a value of two is pretty unlikely. It doesn't happen that often. So you can see that it only happens in a couple cases in this whole time series. Uh, here in, in 540 or so, and then in 1600 as well. So it just, just means that it's unusually cold in that year. Okay, Matthew, thank you. Thank you for your, your great lecture. It was uh, the comments of uh, the teacher. So <laughs> uh, I leave you to appreciate <laughs> the chat. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, for uh, everyone, it is the end of the, our first session. I hope you you like this one, and uh, but you will be able to to join us for tomorrow. It, tomorrow it will be tomorrow morning in uh, in Europe. So um, be online uh, on time. Uh, just if you uh, if you don't. If you're not, if you are not able to available for all the session, you know that we are very. For us, it's very important to to have an evaluation from the teacher. So at the end of a gift, you will have to complete the evaluation form. So I give you in the chat the link to complete the evaluation form at the end of a gift. But maybe you will be with us only today so i give you the the link to complete the, the evaluation form only at the end of the gift so that's mean friday i would like to thanks again matthew from the, the presentation and all the lecturer so grant and um, ray for all this afternoon a very interesting and uh, with some different topics so I think the, the topic of uh, the impact of geology on the society is uh, open now and tomorrow and until Friday, we will go ahead with more lecture and more hands-on activity. So to everyone, 
bye bye see you maybe tomorrow and the day after have a nice uh, evening for european people have a nice day for for the other one and thanks again for the lecture and bye bye see you soon for the next time bye <laughs>